Great. So welcome. This is <laughs> this is our third uh, our third lecture of international business. And what we're going to do today is spend quite a lot of time talking about company strategy, particularly around um, you know international uh, international business, but really a lot around the resource based view of the firm and the um, VRIO analysis. Uh, so the two of them are, are quite closely related, so they're going to make good sense together. But before we get on to that, I thought that it would be a good idea just to spend a few more minutes based on uh, the models that we touched on in the prior lecture, because uh, we, we went, you know, uh, briefly through Porter's value chain, uh, maybe, you know, at a very high level. And then we also looked at Porter's diamond in terms of industry. Uh, those two models have got application when you look at your cases and, and I sent out an email talking about the case studies and saying that actually you'd be able to use um, you know, in, in your introduction or in your analysis. So that's what I, where I think we should start. And then after that, we're going to go on to it. And of course, uh, you know, uh, towards the end of the session, we're going to look at uh, CFAO. Um, yeah, it is recording, I think. Great. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, the red button's going. Yeah, it's recording. It's recording. Oh, okay. But, uh, Okay, so this is the value chain model, and this is one of Porter's um, models, uh, probably one of the earliest ones, in fact, that, that he did. And what we really looked at this for was this idea of where should a firm focus? In other words, what is a, a neat way, a neat model that can help you recognize or remember what are the kind of focus areas that a firm should take on when it's entering a new market? So if you recall where we touched on this, this was actually in connection with the, the Faye Milk case study. We said once they've entered Canada, what are the kind of things that they need to focus on? And, and this is a really neat way to remember what, what areas there may or may not be in order to focus on. The applications are going to extend because when we look at what is the competitive advantage for a firm, uh, you know, we'll be able to track that back here and effectively say this is an area we really think we need to be strong on in order to maintain a firm's competitive advantage. Uh, and so this is a very high level model, but as you can see, you've kind of got this idea of primary activities and uh, you, you know, the, the kind of secondary activities. And so primary activities being that kind of inbound processing, outbound and marketing. So fundamentally, Porter's view is that a business is a set of activities and you see in his later work, this idea that the way your activities are coordinated and interrelated actually leads to these strategic sets. And that's what leads to competitive advantage. Fundamentally, he argues that if you can charge more to a customer for, for the package of activities that is your business, uh, then they cost you, you earn margin. And I don't think any of your accountants, so we don't need to get into a debate about what we mean by margin here. But fundamentally, this idea goes, a business is a package of activities, and that is all of those activities are required to get the final product out. What's perhaps not well represented here is the idea that these different items may have very different uh, importances for different businesses. Uh, and so, relatively, you know, speaking, we should be considering them and saying, actually, in the business that are, is of interest, which one of these has to be a focus area? Which one of these has to be optimized? So when you, this model is really good when you need to think about where to focus once a decision has been made, uh, where are the key weaknesses and or what are the key activities for, for, for a business. And this is actually the precursor to value stream mapping, which is a more kind of in-depth version of understanding how a business processes inputs and turns them into, into a set of outputs. So what I'd like to do now is um, we're actually going to break into... Uh, into groups right early on now. And what the goal here is, is to answer a couple of questions. And that is about in different businesses, what is the area that uh, you think should be the, the top, the, the, the most important uh, and the second most important? 
So really from a, from a, just from a timing perspective, perhaps we would do one, two, and three only. And what I mean by that is, of course, every business will probably have a little bit of all of these dimensions. That's to be you know, expected. So everybody has HR, everybody has technology, everybody has procurement. But the question isn't that, uh, does everybody have this? Rather, when you apply it, what's really important? Um, to some extent, this actually depends on the firm in question. So an individual firm may have their unique advantage that they're exceptionally good at an area. But just for, for the purposes of us being able to uh, work with this a little bit, um, I'm going to list these. Uh, so a Main Street retailer, that's just a general retailer. Uh, a specialty retailer, let's say somebody who's got one type of product, like a, a brand called Bedshed. A general retailer like a Marks and Spencer. Um, but it, that could be an Aldi, that could be a Costco, a local bakery, a restaurant, um, catering. And what I'm going to do now is break everyone into, into groups. Uh, and again, what we just want to do is get some feedback in, as to if you're running that business because you're doing all these case studies and you're also in businesses uh, currently, what do you think the top three things is that drives value? And this is a good lead into that resource-based view, which takes the perspective that not all of these are equally important for every business. And I think, you know, that's quite true. There's, quite, there's very good research uh, and I think uh, just intuitive um, practicality to that. So that's the question. Um, I'm not, I'll put it back up, um, but I don't know when you break into groups if, if it's still able to be, to be seen. Uh, Nick, Nick, are we just supposed to choose one of these uh, business to discuss, or are we going to discuss all of them? Did you get uh, Leon's question? No. Where is that? No, so he just asked, do so they sure discuss all there. the... Uh... <laughs> okay, so the goal here is just, you know, to, to consider this idea that, that different businesses should focus on different areas, and that makes sense. And that, that this model isn't, uh, you know, maybe at an undergraduate level, perhaps... Um, the expectations, you put a bit of text under every single block. But at this level, really, the idea goes, there's a couple that you need to focus on. That more naturally uh, replicates what would happen in, in a business environment. No good so, great. So let's hear from the three groups, uh, what they picked, what they thought. Uh, and then after they've, they've said that, we can just, you know, uh, if anybody disagrees, um, we, we, may, we may see see differences or we may see commonality. Good, so who wants to go? I can kick start Nicholas, so I was yes. first out the gate. Um, so yeah, I was with um, William, uh, Sebastian and uh, Sanjay. Yeah, we picked the local bakery. So first and foremost, we wanted to look at suppliers for, in terms of kind of logistics and procurement, making sure we had high quality ingredients for our bakery. We thought that was number one, because if, if we had terrible products, then yep. Uh, we thought service was next. We want to make sure that we bring uh, customers back, repeat customers uh, at our local bakery. And then we followed that with marketing and sales. So really thinking about how we run locally and drive loyalty. Can I just ask, when you're speaking about ingredients, were you thinking procurement or inbound logistics? Um, we didn't get into a deep conversation. We first put it under inward bound logistics. Cool. Perfect. Uh, what were the other two that you did? Um, service and marketing and, uh, sales. Okay, perfect. So you, you just did bakery on that one? Yes. No problem. Okay, who's next? Yeah, we will go the we will go next. So we chose a main street retailer uh -huh. and hospital and accounting firm. Yep. So for a main street retailer, the top three uh, <clears throat> top three items are marketing and sales and right. operations and uh, service. Service and operations, okay, great. Yeah, and then for right. hospital, 
for hospital uh, service operations and human resource the management. All right. And for accounting firms, uh, service uh, human resource the management. Yep. And uh, sales and marketing. Okay. Cool. All right. And then um, uh, who was the third group? Yeah, we had a third, third group, uh, myself, me, Monica, and Jenny. Uh -huh. uh, we talk about this uh, fast food restaurant, which is uh, McDonald's. Yep. Uh, the, I think the, the three uh, key investment that we talk about in the rank of focus area, which is the uh, inbound logistic All right. uh, and operation, and also outbound logistic. So basically, uh, how, how uh, McDonald's will actually run, we, we know that they are actually, that they have a lot of purchases and a lot of uh, departments is actually working on different things, uh, uh, whether internal purchasing, uh, working alliances with their suppliers and also uh, their uh, part-time workers and full-time workers. So the, one of the key things that uh, they really have to look into is the operation because uh, they must be very clear on how they operate and how, where they're going to save costs and how they actually do the procurement. And to the outbound logistic is uh, scheduling, how they actually distribute the, uh, the goods to the, each of the retails. So you have. All right, uh, well, I mean, add, sorry. To sorry. To, uh, just to add to Leon's point, I think as yeah. we are familiar with McDonald's, they are the same in every store. So that's yeah. why the team felt that these are the three, the most critical in terms of their competitive advantage. So, the so that sameness, what do you think drives that sameness? When you say it's sameness, yeah. it's the efficiency for capacity, technology or what? Yeah, look, I, I suppose what I'm saying is that sameness is, is kind of an indication of, of a very high degree of operational standardization. Oh, yeah. um, I think that anybody here who's ever been involved in, in a McDonald's there's a manual about everything. How many seconds the fries must be in the fryer? How many seconds the meat? How thick is a meat patty? And so what you what they've done is eliminate all this um, you know, inconsistency, and now you have an extreme process environment. Let's just uh, I'm gonna we're gonna go rotate through some of these examples because they're all good examples. So some of the, the differences, if you said instead of this uh, McDonald's, you're gonna run a five-star restaurant, I would suggest that operations definitely drops down that list, mm. right? Would that, be, now, would that be service then? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you might say, actually, we're going to found that the foundation is service because McDonald's is it really about service? No, I agree with mm. you. It's about operations. I want the same burger every single time. I want a five-star restaurant. Absolutely. I'm now saying, well, I want unique food. Mm. So standardizing, it's going to be very unpleasant. I want great service. Uh, and you can you could you could make an argument that um, you know perhaps human resources. Are, I want uh, particularly good chefs. Um, you know, but uh, you know they could be the number three could be. So so this is a great example of why similar industry. Uh, you, you know, some people argue same industry, but very definitely a different business. All right. Uh, the other one I thought was was quite interesting was um, or, or a couple of the other ones. So let's talk about a main street retailer, um, Jones. Uh, or, when she was representing the group. So we had marketing, service, and operations. And so when, when I look at, there's a whole universe out there, but if you think of Costco or Aldi, Walmart, um, you know, some of these huge box retailers, as opposed to, let's say, a department store, uh, which one has service that as a high level? Uh, and, and, and I'm pushing because I think that it's, it's tempting to say service is important for every business. And of course it is. Your customer can't leave unhappy with their experience. But is it equivalently important in main street retailers versus uh, specialty retailers? Um, high luxury? For yeah, of course. Look, a high luxury store, you may want, you know, full, full service option. You want to walk in, somebody presents mm -hmm. to you your option. But if for Costco, I think the um, logistic will be the first priority. I think yeah, well, I would tend to agree that in a Costco versus a specialty retailer, your your SKUs, the number of SKUs you carry, uh, that's the number of independent um, um, SKUs. Uh, for those of you who don't know, SKU is a strategic knowledge unit. It's sort of a, an inventory line. 
but in a Costco, it's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands, right? You carry everything from toilet rolls to yeah. beds to, to tin tomatoes. And so there's no doubt that your ability, your logistics is, is a key part of that. But I would suggest that service is maybe less of a, of a key part. However, if you're thinking of a main, main street retailer as in a big department store, you could think of anything from Nordstrom, right? And Nordstrom is famous for service. That's what they do. You go, you buy something you don't like, and you can take it back, and, and you've got this whole culture of, of what they call Nordies. And, um, you know, it's actually a really nice place to shop. Uh, but but their, their focus isn't the same as uh, the kind of pure hardcore logistics that I would suggest Costco needs to get right. All right, I thought the bakery one, were there any other comments on the bakery? So again, you probably got a couple of types of bakery, right? If you're a high volume output bakery, um, you know, then inbound logistics, you know, is going to be competing with operations. How do you produce a large quantity of goods? Um, if you're a niche bakery, a patisserie type of coffee shop, um, you know, then then perhaps that's that's not so much uh, the, the case. So as you can see, you know, this is an important model for you to really turn over in your mind. It's got to match your strategy. The idea of Porter's value chain is not that you try and tick off each one of these boxes, uh, certainly not at this level, you're going to say, what is my business actually trying to do? Uh, it has application to all business cases, um, you know, including those, those ones that we present. All right, so then we're going to move on and say, the strength of this model uh, is that it is a great overview. And, and it kind of uh, gives you a framework to say, where do I really need to optimize my processes? Uh, perhaps the this advantage, though, is it's not particularly focused on the competitive nature. Uh, it is by itself just a model about this business. And, and it, it doesn't ask the question in any specific way, well, where do you need to be the best for your competition? The exercise we've just done does that uh, because it's very important to go, well, different businesses do need to focus on different elements here. And part of that is because of how they need to compete. You know, a business needs to decide that. Uh, the next thing that isn't so strong here is it doesn't obviously offer you any sort of idea of what creates margin. And that's why we really are talking about the RBV model, because that does, in a much more clear way, say this is where margin is created. Uh, and finally, this model is not particularly intuitive for services, you know, uh, being as it is, you know, uh, maybe a little bit older, and, and you really have this idea that primary, uh, primary activities are stated uh, you know, in the language of goods. Uh, but it is not to say that you couldn't take, as, as we saw, a hospital, which is effectively a services firm, uh, and, and run it through this. Right? And, and similarly with, that, with an accounting service. All right. So that was number one. We touched on this model very briefly in the, in the milk study, and uh, now we've just gone through it and seen how, how it works a little bit differently. The other model that we, we touched on is this idea of uh, Porter's Industry Diamond. Now, we're going to talk about Porter's Five Forces. Michael Porter is you know, a legend and, and kind of um, had three or four, if you want, very, very famous uh, contributions. Um, but this is his Industry Diamond. And again, it is a high level uh, model. Uh, and it talks about, and I'm, I'm using the word carefully here, the potential depth or sophistication of an industry. Uh, but this doesn't really talk about the profitability per se of an industry. So the five forces model, which we'll cover later, really gives insights into what is the profitability of industry players. Uh, this industry is much more about industry sophistication. There is a common element between the two, and that common element is here about firm strategy uh, and structure and rivalry. And that does feed in uh, a lot to, um, to you know, firm profitability. But in of itself, this isn't the model that you really want to be looking for when you try to explain profitability. It is very much a model when you say how vibrant or sophisticated a market is going to be. All right, so we're, also, we're going to, again, go into some groups and just talk about um, these three examples. So each group does need to consider each of the three examples. Uh, and just have a look at how these factors drive, uh, drive the industry. So 
So what we have is three examples, just to get a bit of an overview. So a semiconductor manufacturer, and of course we have some expertise in this, uh, in the class, uh, automotive manufacturer and a call center. And we've created these pretend markets um, that talk about, uh, you know, the, the sort of market size, the power, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we just want to come back and say, how sophisticated is that market likely to be given the examples here? Just so that we have an opportunity to use, uh, to, to use this model. So I'm going to stop sharing, break into groups very briefly. And this way we're going to actually spend a little bit less time if that's all right. So we'll see you back in, in just a minute. We have, a, we have a busy schedule, so um, we'll keep it going, but I'll try and make the breakouts a bit longer. Uh, yeah, so we have, a, we have a bit to get through, so we'll, um, we'll, try, we'll try and make them longer. Okay, so let's, let's hear it. What, what do we think of um, the semiconductor manufacturer? Um, should we just go each example at a time rather than each group at a time? Sounds good. Okay, semiconductor. Do we do we think this is an exciting industry? Is it going to be easy? Is it difficult? Are the what, what do we think about it? A very challenging industry. So basically, the a fixed cost is a high fixed cost is required, and uh -huh. um, manufacturing like the manufacturing equipment and uh, which the required land and the facilities and special like a, a, a condition and etc. So it is not. It is a very challenging um, uh, industry, and also like the semiconductor industry has like the uh, cycle, every uh, yeah. uh, four five years or like something like that. So uh, there are a lot of like the uh, variables. So if I was to push on that and say, those descriptions are are universal for the industry, but what we're talking about here is. In the, in the market described, is this going to be more or less difficult than normal? Uh, because you're quite right, it's a very challenging business. But this question from Porter is, in this country described, is it going to be particularly difficult? Um, you, you, you know, um, the, what you've said is, is, is a universal challenge to, to the industry. Um, so I would suggest, it, just here some thoughts on that. You go, there are some plants in the country, so you probably have some degree of, um, you know, of supply base. Uh, you do have, you know, I mean, there's some sort of factor endowment, which is positive. A detractor is the small market. But given the highly tradable nature of semiconductors, it's not really the case that you need to sell it where you are, right? Shipping is pretty efficient on semiconductors. So here you would say, maybe, uh, maybe this is a, a kind of reasonable, reasonable difficulty country to go into. I mean, let's imagine I said, okay, that's one country. Now I change it to a different country where there's no other semiconductor plants in the country uh, and power is particularly expensive. And I said, pick between the two. I think that's that's the that's the goal of Porter's diamond analysis. Uh, you know, it's not an industry analysis. Remember, uh, you okay. know, there's, there's some degree of about the industry, but you're really yeah. saying, given an industry like semiconductors, do you have related industries? Um, you know, what are your factor endowments given that you have an industry? What are the demand conditions for that? And then finally, what's the likely firm strategy? So you could, you, you could suggest that having other firms, other manufacturing plants leads to depressed pricing, there's no problem. 
But unlike Porter's five forces, this is talking about once you know the industry, what is the industry going to look like um, as opposed to, you know, picking an industry? Because all your comments are quite right. You're absolutely right about semiconductors, but they are general. They're not specific to this country. And in international business, these differences can make the difference between do I set up a plant in this country or in, or in a neighboring country? All right, so let's talk about um, the automotive manufacturer. And Jung, I'm going to ask you, do you want to go again first? Because there's nothing wrong with your answer. That's the whole point. I go, that's the point of what we're doing, right? So, uh, okay. Uh, I think that in this case, so I mean, the, I mean, when I look at the conditions like the given on this the uh, this slide, yeah. um, I think it is uh, relatively uh, relatively less uh, challenging. I mean, of course, like the market is small, but uh -huh. however, like the uh, uh, cheap power and also no other plant in the country. So there will be no competition in that market. But we saw Proton last week. Do you think that no other car plants makes less competition? Maybe. And what does it mean? And what does it mean for your supplier base? Yeah, maybe I can add on. So it, uh, oh. so uh, being the only plant, I mean, it might not be good if there's no other plants in the com uh, country because the supply chain ecosystem infrastructure will be there to support yeah, and, the- Yeah, absolutely. And one of the, Jiung, you've you really touched on one of the challenges of this model, which is it doesn't talk about profitability, right? And, and as I said, it's quite easy to have those two concepts really close together. Um, but, but I agree, you know, you know, I mean, so you've got this problem. If you've got lots of car plants in a market, of course, your pricing is going to be very competitive because your fixed capacity exists. But on the other hand, if you don't have any plants, then will there really be a basis for the supporting industries to, to exist? Mm -hmm. uh, so so, I, so it, it may be better for profitability, but it may be more difficult to have a plant working. You're going to have to internalize all those problems of getting all the components and then you assemble. Now, it's not possible for us to sit here and decide which perspective is more applicable for a market that we don't know and which car brand, et cetera. But it's important that we're just thinking about these different factors and saying, okay, great. Ji Yung is focused here and said, hold on, I may have a lot of rivalry and that's not good for margins. And Vicky said, well, I, I may not have any of these, you know, so, so, so this is a, a pro because I, I, maybe I can get better pricing. And Vicky said, uh, this might be a con. Mm -hmm. Uh, this might be a con because I might not be able to get anything established. So, you know, no problem with either of those two. That's that's exactly how we want to try and use. Yeah. Yeah, quite. Uh, in terms of using that model, Nicholas, I suppose, like we're looking for this kind of how does the industry fit this country, this 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 new market that we're trying to enter. So something yeah. like the car, the car manufacturing space seems quite challenging in that example where, you know, demand, uh, you know, um, small markets or demands could be low infrastructure could be low you know capabilities and labor could be low so it, it's almost like you feel like there's at least three areas there that could be quite problematic for us right yeah and that's why it's not i mean if if we were going to solve it in this class you know perhaps they would just hire the class and say solve for global output and motor vehicle so, you know so clearly it's they're multi-dimensional problems but here we're talking about what's a good use of a model what's bad use so good use is this debate well on one hand we've got this problem on the end i have a benefit and presumably some of you might be presenting uh, at some stage saying, I think we should go into this market or I think we shouldn't. And then there's gonna be some discussion around why. And, and these are frameworks for that discussion so that you have a sense of what are the things I'm asking to trade. Uh, lastly, let's go call center and anyone, anyone to answer. Well, Jiung's done too, so so it's going to have to be uh, Paul, perhaps Paul or uh, Leon. Um, well, yep. So just applying some across here. So in terms of it's a, a large market, so potential there for um, good demand 
conditions and of course good infrastructure play in place. We were talking in our group a little bit about as well with this particular one, how you know high labor costs and how you might be looking at a certain market in terms of cost reduction for labor costs. I think we talked a little bit about call centers in the previous classes. Um, and having other call centers means a competitive environment, um, which, which may be useful in terms of uh, knowledge and, and labor force. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, there's no like having, um, uh, you know, cheap labor, particularly in call centers tends to be a really big plus. Yeah. But, um, you know, and, but the issue is again here, you're right next to a large market. Now, there's no doubt that if you said to somebody, would you rather, would you rather establish your call center business inside, for example, the United States or China, you know, I mean, it, the time zone problems disappear, uh, you're right next to your customers, you know, so, so those are really useful. Um, but we do see globally that uh, some factor endowments, sometimes factor endowments are important. So I would suggest that here you would go for a nuanced view of, well, what's the quality of that labor and what's the quality of the output? So let's say you just needed a simple call center to, to receive customer complaints or something like this. I would suggest the labor arbitrage more important than the closeness to customer because you go you know, easy. I just want a lot of labor and I can easily get these skills in. Yeah. But perhaps if you were looking for very sophisticated services, um, you know, I mean, uh, and, and even some of these get outsourced, but if you want a very dynamic service that needs to be culturally sort of uh, very good, uh, then, then you're probably going to look for something closer. Yeah. All right. So let me show I don't know why that won't go away. There we are. Okay. All right. Um, so this is a great model in terms of uh, you know uh, high level model, um, and it's also sensible in terms of trade theory. Now, just because of time, uh, we were, I'm not going to ask you to recall these, but if you, uh, but Vernon's trade theory was the one that spoke about product life cycles, and he posited that in the initial stages, your founding country, the country that invents a product, they develop all of these services, um, and because they develop all of the stuff, they first export it, and that's really because they take advantage of this, and their demand conditions are better than everybody else. And later other people, you know, other firms get in and the rivalry climbs. And so you can see the dynamic nature of an industry and then other people may take over uh, the production. So that's Vernon. Krugman, if you recall said, and the new trade theory said that you could be so big semiconductors being an example that effectively um, only a couple of firms may be big enough for the whole world. So demand is not big enough for a firm everywhere. And so the first few firms win. Uh, that was his, his perspective. And Leon Tief was really talking about the fact that um, countries uh, export and import products that may not look exactly like their factor endowment. And that is because that first version said only factor endowments are, are important. And as you can see just from this discussion, that actually these three other features are really important when you're trying to understand what is a country going to trade in because uh, these are the sorts of decisions each business is going to take. All right, weakness, obviously, and, and ji -Yung touched on this. Well, hold on, there's no distinction of profit as opposed to sophistication. Uh, and and that's, a, that's quite a key, key challenge. Right, so now we're on to uh, sort of the, the new content. And we're going to be looking at explaining the concept of strategy, I recognize how firms can profit from expanding globally. Just touch on that a little much more in the next lecture. Uh, understand how pressures for cost reduction and local responsiveness can influence choice uh, and the different strategies for competing globally and their pros and cons. Okay. Strategy and the firm. So, you know, we really talk about what is, um, uh, what is, what is strategy here? And I suggest that the neatest 
Nietzsche's definition is that it is a pattern of asset allocation decisions. So it's a very broad definition. But the point of a strategy is that it is, it is a way that you allocate resources over and over again in order to reach your goal. And so that, that, that kind of helps us get away from some of the, the difficult problems that sometimes the strategic definitions can get tangled in. And I don't think there's really a lot of value in tangling in those. So we're going to talk about what should it do? Well, a, a strategy should be good for valuation, right? And, and as you may recall from uh, you know, corporate finance, your valuation is really different by your profit, your growth rate, and your volatility. I mean, you know, that's kind of the three inputs into evaluation. Clearly, strategy needs to drive a good valuation. Right? There's, no, there's no debate about that. I'd suggest that it also needs to be about securing the long-term survival and continuation of the business. Um, you know, um, you could imagine situations where strategy is, we bet everything on something, maybe sometimes we win, maybe sometimes we lose, and you would argue that that's probably not what we'd consider to be an effective corporate strategy. And then finally, uh, nowadays, uh, you know, more and more popular to, to, to say that it needs to be mindful of stakeholder demands, not just shareholder demands. That is very sensitive to which market you're in. Um, at uh, Stanford or Harvard, the idea that there's anybody except shareholders is, is quite heavily debated. You know, whereas really in Europe and a lot of the other parts of the world, this kind of more broad perspective is, is accepted. So I'm going to give like three statements here. And I just think it's quite interesting. Um, you know, um, two of them are by strategy luminaries and one of them is not. Uh, you know, I think you'll recognize that. But this really talks about strategy and, and perhaps the key challenge of strategy, you know, when it comes to a, a senior executive doing it. So the first insight is, is, is not by a professor, but, but by somebody who, who sort of captured a real problem. And, and everybody has a plan until they're punched in the mouth. You know, so Mike Tyson said, and, and, and I think that the point is, strategy is, is not something that works really well. You can do great PowerPoint, you can do great Excel, um, but I'd suggest that nine times out of 10, it's gonna change when you actually deploy it to market. And, and that's the time that, that you really get working. A second interesting dimension is um, from Admiral Parkinson, um, who said that work expands to fill the time allowed. And this really talks about the dynamic nature of your organogram and your human resource strategy and all of that, and what actually happens. So the business will reach an equilibrium. But that equilibrium and the point I'm making here is not something that you can really map out in perfect uh, way on a spreadsheet and then sort of uh, press send. Uh, you know, it's very much a process that moves backwards and forwards while you uh, find equilibrium, you find that your assumptions don't work about the market, uh, you find that the people you've put to do whatever it is are doing things or are not doing things. And, and, and so it's not perfect clarity. It's not like you, you say hi to, to staff members and some of you would have had this experience are you busy? And they say, no, I'm actually only 20% busy. You can give me a lot more work to do, no problem. Typically you ask that question, everybody says, oh yeah, very busy, you know, that's, and that's. And then finally, this idea that Peter Drucker, you know, famously said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And really the key thing to take out here is that when you, when you enter a foreign market or when you discuss entering a foreign market, all of these talk about this idea that an initial plan is really just useful, but it is only an initial plan. And there's going to be a lot of things that change as the plan goes forward. And that needs to be needs to be part of the philosophy. So now we're just going to go through uh, this idea that there's been a long history of strategic theory. Um, and just spend one slide just so that you've got a sense because many of you have come across a uh, you know, huge number of models. There's just models everywhere about strategy. And so, I, you know, I find this very useful way of just uh, you know, creating the kind of map of why are they so different. So clearly in the 20s, uh, you know, businesses were still very, very small by modern standards. And, so, you know, you're talking about Henry Ford probably ran the largest business. Uh, in fact, actually the largest business was maybe an oil business. But businesses were by and large, with the exception of maybe 10, uh, small. And so when we say small, we, we, we think of like under 50 or 100 people. So businesses were quite small and, and these problems of grand strategy didn't exist. And really the answer was planning. 
In the 1920s, you're a good strategist if you just did your Excel sheets um, or the equivalent. Uh, you know, obviously a lot happened in the world. You go through World War II uh, and by the 1960s, you have this idea of portfolio and the BCG portfolio with dog stars, cash cows, um, really comes about there. But this idea goes that you've got money, you can put it in different buckets. By the 1980s, you have what's called SCP, which is Structure Conduct Performance. Um, and, and this school of thought really says that, that your industry drives most of your profitability. And, and that's why you see Porter's Five Forces, why it's such a famous model still, because industry does drive some element of profitability. Uh, by the early 90s, uh, Porter and another group of author, authors, Tracy and Weasima, came up with these fundamental strategies. Many of you may have heard of them. You know, they're going to be the cost leader, you're going to be the differentiator. Uh, they're quite limited, you know, but I suppose they have a, a degree of simplicity that, that sometimes helps explain them. Uh, but, but the world's a lot more nuanced. Uh, we've just gone through a couple of examples where, where I think, you know, tools, at, especially at at an executive level, I think these are probably a little bit uh, underpowered. And in the 90s and 2000s, really a lot more information or study turned to this idea of competitive advantage, uh, strategic intent, uh, and renewal. Uh, and so this idea is that, you know, the, the initially you didn't actually focus, interestingly, um, you, you know, you really were completely interested in only yourself here. Uh, then you were interested in the uh, industry and now you become interested more and more in your competitors and what is your relative difference. Uh, as you can see here, no interest at all. All you got to do is you got what you got, you make a plan with it. Um, then you just, you know, function of your industry and here it's very much about what you decide to do with the assets you've got. So this is a, a fascinating kind of spread and um, and really Rumelt is, is kind of the, the father of this analysis but what you can see here is um, uh, you know the returns here which is uh, up to you know toiletry and cosmetics earning something like 40 percent and then right at the bottom here you've got uh, entertainment telecoms that sort of stuff earning negative returns and this is what the idea that industry drives returns this is kind of a graph so uh, it's very real and it does support Porter's ideas, but I just want to draw your attention to this idea that it probably accounts for somewhere around 20% of variability. So industries are important. If you're in a good industry, you do, uh, it is easier to make good money. And if you're in a bad industry, it is more difficult. But, but as, as the idea evolved, more and more evidence accumulated to say that it is one factor. It's an important factor, but it would be a mistake to just say, and my return is my industry and, and, and that's it. Just to be clear there, Nicholas, I can see entertainment right down at the bottom there. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my industry. <laughs> that's why you've got to listen closely to the rest, right? Because there's hope coming, there's hope coming. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so Porter's Five Forces, the, this is them and this is his model. You've got this idea that, that profitability is a tension between the providers of various factors. So we've got suppliers, we've got substitutes, buyers, entrants, and the manner in which we compete. Um, and so I'm just going to do quite a high level, reasonably rapid view of this model. I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with it. But uh, the more suppliers that can supply your input, the less powerful they are. Obviously, if it's a very unique input, they're very powerful. Um, the degree of integration with your supplier, if you're extremely integrated with your supplier, they are very powerful because you can't simply switch particularly easily. Um, if there are lots of substitutes, this reduces uh, industry profitability. If the perf price performance of the substitutes is good, clearly it also reduces uh, profitability because your buyers, if you try and make more margin, they'll go somewhere else. Uh, and the propensity to use these substitutes. And so we can think of a large number of examples of where, where propensity to use is, is a key thing. So even if you can produce, let's say, medical devices for surgery cheaper, the propensity to use is actually not particularly good. And that, that leads to, to quite high, you know, maintained margin. Uh, just as an example of, 
of an area where it becomes, where it's not it's not just price. We also have buyers. Uh, so oftentimes people say, well, the customer is king and buyers are very important. That's absolutely true. But it is important to kind of uh, think of it in terms of Porter's model, which is if there's a large number of buyers and they're not part of a buying group, they're disaggregated, um, that reduces the, the power of, of any one buyer. I mean, this is not to say social media doesn't exist or one doesn't need to worry about it. Just that in terms of the model, it's, it's not, you know, this is quite concerned with intermediates who are very powerful individually. Uh, also, the competitor availability and switching costs. And then obviously, you've got entrance. And here's another example um, to you of why this model talks more about profitability. Because when you talk about scale, capital requirements, um, you know, the, the, they are key. Uh, and, and that applies to the semiconductor industry as a whole. But it doesn't really differ between countries. All right. So we're again going to do just uh just four examples and that we're going to go into groups and i'm going to try and make sure there's a little more time uh, and what we're looking at is these questions so we know that aircraft manufacturers really bump along the ground in terms of profitability airlines themselves bump along the ground excuse the pun but tobacco is actually quite profitable and so is banking and and some some of these industries who like some of them who don't but that doesn't change their profitability. So we're going to go into the groups and in two minutes. We just want to look again, it's about applying the model. What are the key things that it's telling you? Why do you think the profitability looks the way it looks? If it's a common challenge, then it shouldn't lead to um, uh, a problem of industry profitability by itself. So, I mean, let's take something else that's very complex um, and, and say, well, you know, wh why isn't artificial intelligence loss making business? So there's something not so much just about the complexity of this, um, but, you know, pharmaceuticals are highly profitable, but that's also arguably very, very complex. So something that's common across an industry shouldn't drive by itself the profitability. But what we can say about um, aircraft manufacturers is, I mean, does anybody think there's a great threat of substitutes? Uh, you know, and I'd say, no, not no, really, right? This no, is not really the deal. One, right? I think two key manufacturers mainly, yeah. The major ones. I, I think I think that you know, Paul. There you hit on that. So, threat of new entrants. Is it easy to become a, a major plane builder? No. This is billions and billions and enormous supply contracts. Okay, so we, we kind of we go. Those two aren't probably big factors. There may be some nuances, but not too much. Suppliers to the airplane manufacturers particularly strong. I'd say not very strong. Engine suppliers are pretty strong, but but let's not put that. And so you really get down to, I would say, uh, these two, which we can then debate. One of the things you just said, Paul, is key. The industry rivalry is extremely destructive in this industry. So Airbus and Boeing just undercut each other for pure, uh, pure volume purposes all day, every day. They are also supported by their governments, which drives this bad behavior. So uh, if there were simply two of you, you know, one would suggest that the best situation is for both of you to raise your prices 10% and produce less. But this is uh, this this industry rivalry is uh, is is a feature of industry. Some industries compete in this in value destructive ways. Uh, this is is one of them, and and you've got this crazy rivalry between the two, and you also have governments supporting these industries, which gives them very little room to back off. Uh, and there's a wealth of literature about industry rivalry and ways you can try to reduce this problem. Uh, but when you have governments backing you, it's extremely difficult to back off um, full, thro full throttle competition. And then I would say that another reasonably good answer here is that you have a finite number of very large purchases. So when Emirates goes to Airbus or Boeing, uh, they will squeeze them on that price. 
Uh, and the fact that they have a bad style of rivalry means that it's a credible threat. You don't want to give me the price, I'll go to Airbus. That's it. That's how this works. So, so this, this industry um, you know, is killed, I would say, predominantly by rivalry, but certainly by these two features. Uh, that's, what, that's what, if you were to get into here, you would say that's what kills the profitability. All right, who's going to take on airlines themselves? Jenny, you ready for airline, Jenny? Oh, well, I was on mute. So what we were thinking for airline is that the threat of new substitute is high and the bargaining power of a buyer is high. Okay, so you focused on these two? Yep. All right. Yeah, so let's, let's again, just I'm just going to walk through them, you know, so we spend a bit of time in the discussion, as, as we were saying. So a threat of substitutes, not particularly strong. I mean, we've seen this incredible growth in airline travel, um, driven, yes, by pricing, but but the idea that we're going to go back to rail or something like that, I mean, I think we all agree is, is unlikely. Uh, suppliers, not particularly strong. They, what do they buy? Fuel a lot. You know, I mean, uh, I wouldn't say that this is really a core problem of theirs. So, so fully we agree here. Um, Threat of new entrants. So absolutely, one of the, the oddities I find of this market is despite the fact that everybody destroys value, people can somehow get funding to create a new airline. It's not insignificant capital. So it's, it's certainly not uh, prevalent as, let's say, taxis, but, but certainly entrants happen more than, uh, you know, than, than you would imagine for, for an industry like this. Um, I would, the, the bargaining power of the buyers, uh, you know, the switching costs. So this, this, we can kind of say a plus and a minus. Each customer is clearly disaggregated, right? There's not a lot, they don't rely on bulk purchases necessarily. But um, one of the things that Jenny would probably note is the switching cost is extremely low. You know, you, you, you know the cost for you to not use your frequent flyer points and just go on a different airline is, is, is almost nothing, right? There's nothing that holds you to an airline. But you also have, I'd say, this kind of very high level of industry rivalry, which is driven um, uh, in some ways by what Paul's group, uh, you know, or the group that Paul represents was talking about. And you have a very high fixed cost. And effectively, if you don't sell that seat, uh, you just lose the revenue. And so that provides pressure on the executives who are making the call, sell the last seat at any price because the marginal cost is effectively zero. Uh, and so this drives an unhealthy industry rivalry. And so you've kind of got these three pressures which make it very difficult. And that would apply almost to anything. If you had a local bus service, you'd probably find uh, the same pressures are going to be on it. You know, if, if, you know, so, so logistics often looks, often looks like this. All right, um, profit, uh, tobacco. Who's going to talk about tobacco? Um, Joyce, Cindy, Jiung. Oh, uh, yeah, I will touch on tobacco. So sure. uh, I think we will think that the bargaining power of uh, supplier is high. So because one so I'm saying tobacco is profitable. How huh? cigarette companies remain very profitable despite yes. everything. Yeah. So the supply, yeah, but that would usually, if your suppliers are stronger, usually your profitability drops. Cindy, maybe I grow food. Oh, okay, sure. Okay, yeah. So um, for us, the bargaining power of buyer is high because they can decide the market price they sell. Um, uh, because they have very strong brand representation. And usually tobacco company have their own supplier. So I think the bargaining power of the supplier is high because they have loads of, um, um, because they take the stock in a very, um, um, how to say, they take a lot of stock so they can bargain it in a better price for, yep. them, for them. And also um, because for the tobacco company, they uh, for each country, they they need to get the license. So I think for the threat of new entrants is low. And also the threat of the sustained to also is low. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, let's, so the bargaining power supplies, I just want to get the terminology right here. I, I agreed with your answer in the end, but 
So we say their suppliers are weak. The tobacco companies are strong, right? Just, just the, the way the, the language is in the model. So the suppliers are weak, particularly weak, right? You buy from tobacco farmers that are no match for, for, for the consolidated buying power. So, so you tend to have very depressed farm prices, which is just the way the world is. I'm not suggesting it's inherent about tobacco. It, um, and so they're weak. You're right, new entrants today to set up a tobacco company is, is gonna be extraordinarily tough from a regulatory perspective. You're also not gonna set up on many substitutes. A customer can choose a different brand, but that is not the same as a substitute, right? This is an industry analysis, not, not, a, not a company analysis. Your industry rivalry is actually very tame. Right? You do not see particularly amongst the major tobacco producers much discounting. You want the cigarette, you buy it, and they, they, they live in a price. You have some slightly premium, some slightly less premium, but you don't see like with airlines where you go, sometimes I book a seat and it's a thousand US dollars, sometimes I book it and it's five thousand US dollars. The pricing is quite small bands. So you have very little industry rivalry because they've kind of decided that actually it's more profitable to not do that. And your buyers are not, they're not aggregated, right? These are individuals buying retail products. And, um, and the switching cost is a, is a brand issue, right? So, you know, the taste and the brand and so on. And so because this is weak, right? This is weak and this doesn't exist. This doesn't exist. This doesn't exist. You end up in a very profitable industry. And that's, so it's, it's not about if you want them profitable or not. Okay, does anyone want to do banking or should I go through banking and we press on? I'm happy to have a go. <laughs> I don't know if it's right, but it's worth a, a chat. No problem. Um, look, I, I, banking, I feel, is profitable. Um, I feel that there's um, a high bargaining power of buyers um, or customers in this instance. I've sort of put, the, I've put customers in, in buyers. Would that be right? Yeah, yeah, so a uh, buyers is your customers, yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I think there's high there, and I think there's high uh, bargaining power of uh, suppliers. Um, I'm not. I'm not no. sure. Okay, I don't know. I'm just trying to get my head around this one. <laughs> Okay, so let's let's go through this. So I think bargaining power of the suppliers is very low. Yeah, so, so this this is oh, probably okay. this is probably the capital market, right? So mm -hmm. they go, they issue bonds, it's almost perfectly priced. Um they they don't tend to go to an individual one supplier. So remember we said a supplier is strong if they have a unique input that you need that nobody else can provide if they're very integrated into your process. Whereas effectively banks approach the, the bond market okay. and they, they issue bonds. So I would say that they're quite disaggregated. Yeah. Fairly perfect pricing. They can turn against them, but but in terms of the industry, remember, this is not about individual companies, ports is fire force about the industry. In terms of the industry, bargaining power supplies, there's pretty muted. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. It's banking, quite yeah. banking supplier, Nick. <laughs> A banking supply, there's two big suppliers in banking. The capital markets are the one, and the other one is the labor market. Mm -hmm. And neither of them is very powerful compared with a bank. Okay. So, so you know, that's what a bank is. It's lots of people in offices tapping the credit market. Lots of operations. From a value chain perspective, operations is key because if they don't work well, it's actually a miserable customer experience. And if they do work well, your, your expense ratio is lower. Uh, so if you if you look at any bank's financial statements, you're really worried about interest um, and then the expense ratio and that's it. So it's people and, and interest. Okay, so, so there's nothing there. And nothing to threat to new entrants, right? So this is such a heavily regulated industry. One of the perverse outcomes of more and more and more and more and more regulation is us as consumers get worse and worse and worse banking yeah. experience. Because yeah. you try to set up a bank today, you've got to be Basel III compliant. You need more licenses than you can count. And you need hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of mm. capital. So there's no more entrance. So would the industry is, recovery then would be classified as high if your bargaining, if the bargaining powers of bargaining power buyers would also be high, right? 
So here, I think I'm a, I'm a buyer of banking services. Uh, I don't yeah. believe my bargaining power is particularly high at all. Oh, okay. Uh, if okay. I, I mean, I can choose a different brand, but can but would I? You not, would you not shop where your interest rates are slightly lower, for example? Yeah, I can. So remember, this is an industry analysis. Yes, yeah, sorry. So what you're really yeah. thinking about is, do I have the ability to ask the bank for a particularly better deal in a way that it's likely to respond to? Yeah. And the switching to competitors is probably better thought of in the middle here. Yeah, okay. It's not exact. These aren't cut and paste things, but so the buyers aren't particularly strong. So I'm gonna, I'm not Idiot. too sure I agree. I think, <laughs> I think at best we are, we are pretty irrelevant in the banking world. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly the service seems to suggest to me that we don't matter. Um, and then finally industry rivalry. And I think that what you see is when interest rates move, they move pretty much in unison. Yeah. Uh, and so, come, uh, and there's lots of different types of banks. So I don't want to get trapped. Uh, you know, somebody says, hold on, Goldman Sachs doesn't look like this. Yeah, I get that. But we're talking about just banks that, that lend to us or lend to businesses. And they're profitable because probably the single biggest thing is that nobody can ever do this, right? Because there's so much regulation that, that nobody can compete. And so even though they're bad at what they do and we all hate them, you can't go and set up against them. And as soon as that happens, it means that you don't need to compete too ferociously with each other because what's the real risk? I mean, mm -hmm. even if I beat you to death, nobody can get in. So why well, put myself through the pain? So we have a situation where you can't get new entrants. There's no real quality substitute. The supply of power is little and um, yes, really yes. they're going to remain profitable in my perspective for a long time um, because even with FinTech, the, the, the regulation requirements is the thing that really holds back competition in banking. Mm. So FinTech is wonderful and it's our only hope to get better banking services, but the regulators are, are all powerful. Okay. I, I have a question, yes. uh, Nicholas. So like uh, the, when I reflected the case study we did, which is a uh, the yeah. China uh, uh, daily uh, product company. So mm -hmm. Uh, they were thinking about like the whether or not they will they will have operation in Canada yeah. uh, or like they will have operation in China. Let's say uh, I mean this is the example. So in that case, this is the four thousand five forces analysis that should be done in terms of a China domestic market as well as a China uh, the Canada market. Am I correct? Yeah, that's right. And you'd yeah. have two separate ones because. They're in two different countries. So if we look at, at, the, at, at infant formula, because Fairy Milk is infant formula business, suppliers, you're talking about cows and farms in Canada. This is really small. In, in Can I'm sorry, in China, it's, it's quite small. You're buying from farmers. And, and as I said, typically, they don't get great deals. In Canada, you've got this cooperative. And so in Canada, you may say that uh, the milk price is set. So that's a very powerful supplier. So that, that is not good. That is not good for Canadian profitability, right? Because all of a sudden you've gone from, I pay the farmer what the lowest price he'll accept to there's a price set uh, and now you've gone to one supplier. Um, you know, so infant milk formula, threat of substitutes is gonna be quite small. So, you know, that's not gonna be an issue. Your buyers are gonna be disaggregated. And again, I just wanna to touch on this. It doesn't mean they don't care about scandals Buyers can leave your business, but as an industry, your buyers aren't squeezing you for a particularly better deal. I can't call head office and say, give me a discount. Whereas in, if you're Emirates, you can definitely do that to Boeing. So, so that's maybe a neat way of thinking about it. The threats of new entrants, well, the more complicated the technology and the more regulated, uh, you know, the, the fewer those entrants can be. And the rivalry seems to be fairly mild. So I would suggest they're probably going to stay quite profitable. But the big change in their life actually happened here. Uh, Canada, you know, if um, the, the profitability you would imagine in Canada will be lower because they don't have so much power on the price of the input. That's the milk. Okay. okay. Thank you. But there is a problem. And um, for Paul, there is salvation. And this is what it looks like uh, inside one industry. This is steel. It happens to be steel. I just, that's the graph. It's steel. And here is the spread of profitability. So as you can see, steel has got just as much variability as there is between industries. So this is inside one industry. And this actually
actually accounts for, in the end, more, um, more variance in company profitability than industry does. Estimates vary. Rumelt, who did the kind of uh, the biggest studies here, uh, uh, had a very big difference estimate. He, he reckons this is four or five times more important. The company is four or five times more important than the industry. Uh, Gemawat and Rivkin kind of put this at around, uh, you know, one and a half to two times as important. So, so what have we just been talking about? We're saying, why, have, why has the study of strategy evolved the way it has? And you, we saw that um, we started just looking at planning and calling that strategy. And then we were talking more generally uh, about uh, sort of better models. Um, and Porter came up around about the, the 80s talking about this idea that, that your profitability is linked to your industry. And, uh, and then more recently, we're saying, well, actually, that's less important than, um, than your company strategy. All right, so I just, you know, in, in, in kind of a very high level way, um, you've kind of got three things. You've got what your competitors offer your customers, what they need, and what you offer them. And you really make the most profit if you can sit inside this area here, where you're not competing with your customers, as we've just gone through Porter's model, which is a more sophisticated version than this. So we don't really, this is not really used. Um, obviously, this area here tends to be heavily contested right, because your competitors can do it. So the price you're going to achieve there is going to be lower. Um, and this area is waste, right? You and your competitor can both do it, but nobody wants to pay for it. And so we're now moving towards this RBV. So where do your advantages uh, come from? Uh, and this is what the resource-based view or, um, of the firm is. And as I said, you've got these two areas which the customers want. Uh, Porter talks a lot about what are the interactions between us and our competitors. Uh, and so we, we're left with a sweet spot. And if you want to talk about where the business is going in many years, and that's part of the case today, uh, that's strategic intent question. Okay, so on to the resource-based view. All right, so resources are uh, tangible and intangible assets of the firm. Uh, so tangible assets are things like factories, um, you know, products, intangible, and things like reputation. Um, and, and the resources are what you use to, to create your, your strategy. So what are the general categories of resources? Uh, and we can sort of just call them four categories, financial, physical, human, or organization. But it wouldn't be a problem if you used Porter's value map to say what are the categories of resources. The point of resources is it's some things, some assets, tangible or intangible, that, that a firm uses in order to compete. Capabilities, just to get the definitions out the way, because uh, you, you may hear them almost used interchangeably, are uh, um, when you package a group of resources together, you're able to do something. Those are your capabilities. Um, so a factory by itself is a resource. Um, you know, whereas a factory that you've got high tech workers in is now a capability. Um, so don't worry, we're not going to be pedantic around that. A second very key concept here. So we've got the idea that you've got assets in a business. Um, a second key issue is that um, firms are heterogeneous. They are not the same. The way you've packaged your resources together is different from your competitors. And, and, and the, the variety is nearly infinite. So this is just a, a way of, and, and it's a little bit economics intense of saying why that matters. When a market produces price of this, so let's say this is a boom market, and I'm just saying it's boom for the example. You can see that the high cost firm will still produce at quantity Q1 and the low cost firm uh, may produce at quantity Q2. So your low cost firm is producing, your high cost firm is also producing. The point here is that their cost curves are different because their resources are different, their capabilities are different. And so they will look different if, the, if boom times end um, and uh, let's say the, the demand curve shifts uh, and so the price level now becomes this bottom level here 
then what's going to happen is your quantity for your high cost firm is going to collapse down to there. And your quantity for your low cost firm is going to shrink as well, but it's still going to stay in business. So it's very important to have this idea that firms are different. They're different in their capabilities and their assets. And, and that follows through from the resource bay view. If firms don't are different in their composition, then, then they would all behave the same way. So the resources that a firm can create competitive advantage through um, must be valuable. So they must produce some value that a customer wants. Um, you know, firms can do other activities, but if they're not valuable, they're not going to be part of any resource that you can identify. They have got to be rare. And they have to be something called inimitable. And I want to pause here uh, and talk about what leads uh, to um, non-imitatable um, things. And, and you can both provide uh, examples. We're going to break out here just for a minute. You can provide examples of this. But I'm also looking for what are the kind of features, and I think, I think the readings that touch on these, what are the features that make things difficult to imitate? So, you know, there's a little bit more than, I, I can give you an example of something that is difficult, but I'm saying, what is it about it that, that led to it being quite difficult? I think that, uh, are we going to have a break? I was gonna break into groups, but if you'd prefer, we okay. can just do it this way. Which, what, what's the preference? Uh, I will ask the, my uh, classmates. Okay. Okay, cool. We're going to break and uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Okay. Let's get some ideas. What makes you inimitable? Vicky, um, you want to share? Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, Paul. I was just going to throw some out. I was going to say, uh, we were talking about control over suppliers in terms of potentially licensing and patents. Yep. So, it's, uh, can I, so uh, our discussion, it's, it's about a unique service code, uh, a unique culture of a firm such as like uh, Apple or Tesla, they had a unique culture, which is like yes. a big, well known to the market. So they have a big fans, a big fans of pool of customers. Not everybody can copy or imitate by the ways. And also the exploitation, like having a group of people who can exploit the technology, but not the technology itself. So the group of people, the talents can be imitable. Mm -hmm. And also the, um, uh, also the physical location for a firm, like if they are already located in a, in a firm, in a location which is really marketable or uh, having a good exposure to customers, that could be also a, a imitable resources or a capability. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, for us, basically it would be skill, a uh, skill set complexity of the products or the system that they actually implement. Uh, likewise, for example, like the uh, Apple ecosystem, the product ecosystems that uh, actually is very difficult to break off if let's say you already um, uh, work on it or having the products. And also the uh, protected of our policy patent. And also sometimes it's the government policy each, uh, uh, in, in different countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the let me you know one of the key ways to you, you know so these have been some great great answers. Some of the key things to um, highlight of them is this idea that most people have touched on, which is that that they tend to be clusters of activities. So we spoke about the Apple ecosystem, very very difficult to imitate, right? And and the whole point is that you could create one app, no problem. You could create a phone, no problem. Could you create a phone and an app and an ecosystem like Apple? Very, very difficult. Um, you know, and similarly, we, we, you know, Becky's talking about a unique culture. So you could create, um, you know, some, some research output. That's okay. You could create some scientists 
are you able to put them together in a you know in a way that makes them produce good output year after year after year? That's very difficult to do. Uh, whereas copying is easier for for a lot of reasons, right? So that's why being an innovator in an innovative company is actually very challenging because you need to you don't have a goal. You just have to put people together and get them to produce. Um, so Paul also mentioned suppliers. So a, a complex supply network is difficult to imitate. Perhaps not impossible, but difficult. Um, you know, so, so these are, are good reasons why. And, and the key thing that you're highlighting is that, um, that they're complex systems. Any one thing in today's day and age is, is replicable. So a, uh, nobody said, oh, if you've got a patent, it's inimitable. It makes it more difficult, but it doesn't stop anything in, in any real sense. From some of the, 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 the kind of technical aspects of, of the, the literature, uh, they also cover some ideas like causal ambiguity. And, and some of you may have come across this and kind of gone, what, what, what do they talk about? And, and causal ambiguity is when you see a competitor who is making a lot of money, it's not always obvious why they're making a lot of money. So to come back to Vicky's example, you go, I see a competitor, they're, they're, they're really producing amazing products. Uh, things are going really well. I love the iPod, I love the iPad, but I'm not sure how to recreate that, right? Not only is it difficult, but it's not easy to unpack. So these aren't questions of, I need a lot of money. Needing a lot of money is okay, but it's, it's not sort of sufficient. Uh, what you, well, one of the key drivers here is this idea of causal ambiguity. I'm not 100% sure how to replicate what they've done. Uh, there's also unique historical circumstances. So if you're Google, you created Google and you're now inimitable, right, in any real sense. But that wasn't the case uh, when you were around with Yahoo and the internet was exploding. Today, for somebody to replicate, almost impossible, uh, but that is a bit of timing uh, a bit of good fortune, um, you know, so this is, this is how it looks. Clearly that isn't to say that you can't lose it because the industry will continue to evolve. And so just like Nokia, uh, you know, it, it's quite possible for, for each, for a company to, to not survive. But the point that this makes is that you do accumulate advantages if you, you know, that, that may not be available, frankly, to, to other people. Uh, and, and social complexity is, is again, this, this idea of um, ecosystems, unique culture, product ecosystems, skill sets, uh, you know, they make it very difficult to, to imitate. And, and the last thing is it needs to be non-substitutable. And what that means is just because somebody can't uh, recreate what you've done, they shouldn't be able to just go and buy a different version, right? So, I mean, so I think this talks very fundamentally about how do you create a competitive advantage? And remember, Porter's value chain didn't say why margin should exist. It simply said, if you can charge more than it costs you, you will be profitable. Well, you know, that's sort of obvious. But this highlights these key things that says you need something that's valuable and rare and difficult to imitate or impossible and non-substitutable. One of the interesting things Vicky mentioned was location. So clearly, if you occupy some absolutely amazing real estate and you are a fast food business or, or a department store. And this is something very, very difficult for your competitors to replicate. Uh, so you don't need to be too narrow or too high level about this. It doesn't, you don't always, you're not always going to be analyzing, you know, Airbus, um, you know, these, these principles are, are applicable. Just to kind of uh, talk about the point, um, you know, the, so cash and commodities are, are easy to imitate. Uh, and, and that sort of sounds, in, you know, a bit strange, like, well, you know, if they're so easy, just how about you hand them out? But the point being that they're not embedded in a complex web of competencies. Uh, economies of scale are a bit more difficult because it's not just money. So if I could access the market, I still can't quite sort out economies of scale. Brand loyalty, favorable cost position, uh, happy employees, reputation for fairness, very, you know, difficult. And then, as you pointed out right up at the top, unique assets like mineral rights. So maybe, you know, if you're worried about a restaurant, what happens if you've got unique mineral rights? Uh, this is not possible to imitate. So there's like a, a line, just a way of thinking about what is imitable and what's not. 
Now, clearly, sustaining competitive advantage um, requires erecting barriers and then maintaining them, right? Otherwise, you don't have sustainable. So um, there's a quote by an Australian professor, good strategist seeks not only to win the hill, but to hold on to it. And so we saw this from Barney talking about the um, competitive advantage. What are these things that lead to sustained competitive advantage? And the language is, is maybe you know, a little on the academic side, but the, the point is that there needs to be some limits to competition like causal ambiguity, like um, uh, you know, unique location or unique assets because these limit the competition that's available. You can't compete this away. And, and because of that, your rents are sustained. So we've now looked at Porter's five forces and we've spoken about what, me, what makes you able to sustain profit. But now we're saying, if you're a company inside an industry, well, you know, there are good reasons why sometimes people can't compete with you because you have something valuable, rare, difficult to imitate. And difficult to imitate, we've spoken about. Um, heterogeneity, as I said, is, is simply this idea that it's not always possible to tell who is, has got a better set of, of um, assets because in a good market, everybody looks fine. Uh, Warren Buffett said, you know, you can't tell who's swimming without shorts when the tide is in. Wait till it goes out. Um, you know, they have to be imperfectly mobile. Otherwise, people can buy them out. So if you have one superstar designer, that is not called, uh, you know, that is not a basis of sustainable competitive advantage because they're mobile. They will be purchased. The price might be high. It could be very high, but in the end, it doesn't really matter. And then interestingly, they also talk about this uh, ex ante limits to competition. So um, if if there was perfect competition when you were establishing your business, then it is unlikely you'll ever be able to create competitive advantage because all of the advantage would have been traded away right up front. So I wouldn't, wouldn't be too stressed about this, but this is the, that's the full sort of scope of the resource-based view. And I think what's important to remember is the, v, the valuable, rare, inimitable um, uh, idea. Right, so resource-based view is really fundamentally, this is just a bit of a recap. I have a group of assets that can be tangible or intangible. And if I put them together in a unique way, um, then I am, uh, you know, so one is those assets need to be in line with my production of value. I need to be able to do something that's quite rare and I need to be difficult to imitate. And if you have this, then you have some sustained competitive advantage and you can, you can make a profit. And that leads us on very nicely to, to this VRIO analysis. And if you don't mind, I'd prefer to go through this before we break because it's only a few slides and it's right along the lines of the RBV. So VRIO um, uh, value, and VRIO stands for Valuable, Rare, Inimitable and Organized, um, is an analysis of the sticky nature of resources and capabilities and the difficulty of their replication elsewhere. And if you get this right, you, you're profitable. The very key assumptions is that there are differences. And as you can hear, we've spoken about this before and that resources are immobile um, because otherwise they will be bought or traded between firms. And that's not a basis of advantage. So within these two key assumptions, and you just got to make sure that those assumptions are fulfilled when you do the analysis. You don't need to write a paragraph on that, but this is a fundamental assumption. If these are flawed, then then you, you you can't use you can't use the analysis. And so this comes from Barney's work as does that RBV. So value is does it remember V in VRIO is a value. Does your customer want it? And do, do, you know rareness. Do, do your competitors possess it? Now inimitability we've spoken about. So there's different scales of difficulty to replicate. Uh, we've spoken about how you can create it. Uh, we've said that sometimes it's ambiguous what is actually the cause. Sometimes it's a history or path-based thing that you've accumulated this advantage and that's fair. An accumulated advantage is real. Um, 
And then is it organized? And this organization concept is important because it talks about, can you actually extract value from it? Um, so it's not enough to just have these resources, but they need to be rare. They need to be difficult to imitate and you need to be organized. So um, the temporary advantage of valuable and rare resources is sustained only if it's difficult to imitate it. So the more difficult, the longer your advantage, um, and then the, the, the natural processes are things like unique historical conditions, uh, first mover and path advantage, that causal ambiguity, social complexity, and uh, things like patents. So this is, this is identical, right? This is why these two model, this model is kind of uh, the same thing. So what about intangible assets? Um, you know, are they also an advantage? And I think we all agree that they are because the answers provided previously was really talking about intangibles. Um, you know, there are some tangible assets that are very difficult to imitate, but by and large, we were talking about things like product ecosystem. This is an intangible thing. Uh, you, you know, culture, patents, skill levels, um, policies. So, so these are these are intangible. And I just want to talk about two or three, um, two or three ideas that really underscore this uh, this point that uh, intangible assets are very very important. So this is the Chinese car market. Uh, as you can see, there was a peak there, but some, it's the world's largest car market now, twenty five million. Uh, up from 10 million, so it's just staggering growth. Uh, and Chinese automakers have really dramatically improved their quality and technology, where over here you had, you know, really, quite frankly, quite poor vehicles. Um, to today, you've got, you know, quite good quality vehicles and, and the gap isn't, isn't really that substantial. But, and here's the big but, their share of their own domestic market has sat around about 40%. So, I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's a little bit more than that, it's about 44% this year, I think. And so if it was simply about this idea of manufacturing knowledge, we would have expected the share to be higher, right? We have a cost advantage, we're local. Why doesn't it do that? Because there's no doubt in 2009, these were not competitors are in the sense of good quality products that are fair competitors. This is really cost-based competition. Uh, but now by 2020, if, if you conceptualize the world simply in terms of, well, um, the technology transfer will occur, then you should expect that the share of the Chinese market that goes to Chinese automotive manufacturers should increase rapidly. But it's quite flat, uh, you know, and, and um, and it also tells you that if it's simply about patents, then the manufacturing cost advantage should also, you know, disappear as patents move on, right? It's not particularly difficult, and it even wasn't in 2009, to copy a Toyota Hilux. And so this is important just to recognize the this philosophical problem of the Red Queen. And the Red Queen problem is um, just a simple concept that goes, you need to run faster and faster to stay in the same place. And so what you're really seeing in, in this, and this is well illustrated with very, very intense competition, with government meddling, with all sorts of money in the market. So I go, this is, this is as hard fought as anything else, is that these intangible assets, things like brand reputation, things like the accumulated knowledge of producing good cars, accumulated knowledge of, of uh, better design, uh, actually is very, very difficult to compete away. Uh, and here you have a market where if you argued any market could possibly compete, it would be this one where you've had staggering growth. You've got, uh, in 2009, there's something like 100 manufacturers. Um, but just as we said in our last lecture, this industry spends hundreds of billions of dollars on research. And that, you know, and this sort of constant progress is a source of sustained competitive advantage. Is there an element, Nicholas, of moving into innovation in this as well? I'm just reading yeah. that slide there. I was thinking of like Lego, an uh, interesting one. They, their patent famously ran out many years ago, and now yeah. everyone can make Lego bricks, but they still hold an extremely high level yeah. of uh, brand reputation and also innovation to drive them. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's another example. You go, it's 
you know, so if you did, um, so, so you're right, you would look at Lego and you'd say, what are our key competitive advantages? And you would really be thinking of, uh, as I, and uh, you'd be thinking of their, their creativity, their manuals, the fact that they're linked with, with current brands. So when a movie comes out, there's a Lego set that's associated with it. Yep. Uh, you know, it's a standardized quality product. They're fairly well priced. Um, and, and so when you look at the Porter's analysis, you would go, okay, cool. If I wanted to compete or if I was Lego, what are the features here that I really want to be good at? Um, just to, just to get us to break. And um, so, uh, you know, this is just an idea of tangible versus intangible. So uh, intangible value looks like something like 80 to 85% of uh, market value. Uh, so if you discount the value of actual cash flows at the moment, uh, mm. by far the vast majority of the stock market valuation is intangible. And, and that's just been a trend for a long, long time. And so just like it, just a couple more slides. So the VRIO analysis lives in this thing that has, you've got the four dimensions we've just discussed. Am I valuable? Am I rare? Am I difficult to imitate? And am I organized or exploited? And what that has is implications. All right, so here we say, all right, if I am not valuable, then uh, don't do it. If I'm valuable but not rare, then anybody can do it. And um, you know, this is just a brutal competition. If I'm valuable, rare, but I'm able to be to compete, but I am exploited, then I do have a temporary advantage. And then of course you get this idea that I'm valuable, rare, difficult to imitate, and I have a sustained competitive advantage. And so that is kind of, when you, when you do this inside a firm, you should consider a good practice is to think of five to 10 um, resources or capabilities, uh, you, you know, to, to kind of do this style analysis. And as we've just gone through, you've got uh, these kind of different rows that tell you what you can expect from a profitability. It is important to redo it for each new market because a resource in one market may not be they may not be rare or even valuable in another. Um, and the more dissimilar the markets, the more important it is just to analyze this and make sure that the focus areas are the same. Uh, one of the key things to note here, and it's not for this lecture, but in emerging markets, sometimes firms exist because they solve market problems. In other words, the market is inefficient. Perhaps there's a lot of regulation. Perhaps there's uh, labor inefficiencies. The firm solves those problems. That is valuable in an emerging market and it's rare, it's very difficult to imitate. That's why you see the emergence of groups. But that skill means nothing when you move to a developed market that doesn't have those market imperfections. It's no longer valuable. So continued focus on it in that uh, new market is, is wasteful. Uh, capabilities are know-how, and as, as organizations solve problems, they do build their capabilities. Uh, so, as we said, this is a constant process. This is the Red Queen idea that says that path dependency is a real thing. And, and if you get very good at something, you can keep building on that expertise, and you may change your market, uh, but, but it, it is difficult to overtake. And then one of the concepts that we're coming to is this idea that capabilities have a finite range of applications. And the more similar the application, the more similar the outcome. So if you've got a well-honed skill in area A, you can apply it to area A. And if you can find another area A, you can apply it to get the same returns. But the more dissimilar by the time you're at area Z, your returns are gonna look terrible because your capabilities no longer match the market. Uh, and so this is, a, this is an important part we're going to talk a little bit more about. Uh, internationalization, just to start us on this new topic, um, shows clear evidence of learning. So it's actually a skill that firms have. The more they do it, the better they do it. Nicholas, I have a question. Can I just yep. make sure before you go to this, you mentioned that you should do your VIO in the new market. Uh, what is in cases of a merger acquisition? Do you do it even if it's still the same market? Um, so what you're going to do is when you, let's say you buy in your own market, um, but you buy a new firm, 
yes, they will have their own VRIO, their own unique way of competing. Now, if you are simply buying an exact replica of yourself for market share, one, I would question why do that acquisition because they, they really work. But, but then arguably your VRIO, you already know it. And, and, but yes, for that, for every firm, they're going to have a unique set. They're going to be heterogeneous. They're definitely going to be different from you. And you need to understand what is their competitive advantage? Why do they compete and survive? So uh, yeah, I think that it is applicable. As I said, this isn't a, a production of paper exercise. You're looking at about five or 10 um, things, and then you try to just understand which are really important and which are organized. Thanks. Okay, so identify the key resource that makes the competitive advantage in the home market. And then what are the differences in the market? And then what are the key resources that are expected to make the competitive advantage in the target market? So what do I have? What's the difference? And what am I gonna to need to adjust to compete? And then you work on organizational design and alignment. Uh, just a, a practical point here. It's quite common to have um, a stable role culture in home markets. So this is finance, HR, marketing, whatever. Uh, just be very careful. This is probably one of the more, more common problems uh, of any internationalization strategy is that people try to take the stable culture and then they say, well, just go into a new market and use the same thing. And it's just not responsive enough. Uh, and, and it's a good example of where you need to go, well, hold on, what is, what is it going to take to win when we internationalize? I'm not going to spend any time on these because I'm not, uh, they're not particularly core to what we're talking about, but just know that these are alignment models, they're not strategy models. And, and the key thing to note is that uh, you can, you know, what you need to ensure is that when I pick a strategy or my resource, uh, do I have the people are they incentivized in ways that make sense? Uh, you know, do we have the processes working? So this is quite granular and is the structure appropriate? And this is where the role structure comment came about. Uh, I put the two next to each other because I think these two models came out within about one year of each other. Um, and, you know, you can make your own conclusion about that. Um, so they are almost, they're very, very similar, uh, similar in application, I don't mind which one you use if you use either. But this is to make sure once you've decided on your strategy, once you've decided what are the key resources, what is your VRIO analysis look like? This is how you implement uh, on a practical level, you know, outside of this course, uh, this is useful because it, you know, it sort of closes that final gap. But just remember that organizational design and alignment is in service of your competitive advantage, not the other way around. Right, so, so you can't start with an alignment model and then decide what your RVB is. Uh, and I think we're going to take a break there. So it should be to about 10 minutes. Uh, and then we're going to have just a little bit on, uh, on some internationalization and, uh, and then our case study. So um, see you back here in about 10 minutes. Thanks, Nick. Oh. Nick, uh, I have a question. I want to ask about the assessment one. Uh, our deadline is on Thursday. Uh, mm -hmm. Can we delay a bit as we just know about how to do the, um, the RPV today? Uh -huh. you, you, you want us to try to change that date? Uh, yeah, because four of us, you know, we need to work. So we need to organize a time for good work. But if uh, we need to hand up on Thursday, so yeah. it's a bit tight for us. No, it's okay. Wednesday. Look, I need to I so, need to sit with Greg and just figure out how, how we do that. I mean, that's uh, you know that yeah, might so, be quite yeah. So 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 presentation deck is just submitted on Wednesday. But if we, I mean, usually in other unit, uh, we are expected to uh, submit the presentation deck on the same day when we make the uh, presentation. Oh yes, yeah, so, look, I'm fine with the presentation being submitted on Thursday. It's as long as it's before the lesson, that's fine. Yeah, okay, thank you. So I, I don't know if that goes far enough for you, or you know, I mean, if, if we need to move the whole thing, that, that's that's a substantial adjustment. So I need to just check if, if that's okay to do or not. So I'll check Hi, but, you know, during the break. Mm. Okay.
Okay. We'll see you now. So uh, we'll be back probably in about yeah, eight minutes now. We'll see you. All right, back on and recording. Okay, and now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, diversification, and uh, this will bring our slides uh, to an end, and then we can move on, or we can just get some questions, discuss anything that uh, we may need to just expand a little bit on, and then move on towards um, in the case of uh, CFO and uh, Toyota Tusha. All right, so the question of diversification. Firms diversify, and this is the kind of the big statement, when uh, they have extra capacity in one of their resources. So we've spoken about the resource-based view of the firm. And so we've said resources can be tangible or intangible. They can be factory capacity. Um, they could be patents. They could be skills. Uh, but the point is that diversification occurs when you have extra capacity in one of these areas. And the diversification happens to an area where the capacity can be used. I mean, it sounds pretty, pretty sensible. Uh, the more different the area, the lower the returns that a firm can earn. So we spoke about resources being quite specific. So a resource isn't, uh, the more or the less imitatable a resource is, the more specific it is in, in general. And you saw that graph which had cash and commodities tend to be um, you know, they can be used anywhere, but the returns that they can earn aren't particularly good. Whereas your most super specialized things are the least imita imitable, but they earn the best returns. Um, and so that summarized the more specific the resource and the nearer or the more similar the, um, the, the diversification, the better the return. Um, but just remember that any diversification is challenging. So this goes to the heart of the idea of what is a resource and it's not you know cash uh, in terms of the accounting sense although a big balance sheet can be a, an asset or it can be a resource uh, that is the least specific and so it tends to offer the lowest returns so here we've got um you know i mean a, a graph which talks about what diversification looks like and this rent is uh, profit and here you've got extent of diversification. And as we said, diversification occurs when you have excess capacity in a resource. So the question is, why does the relationship look kind of like this? You, you know, so the, this is the, the theoretical relationship, but it's, you know, you can test it against a lot of data and say, well, why does profit slowly decline as you diversify further. So do you have, I mean, can we have some uh, inputs or commentary about that? Just because you're moving away from your core competencies. So you're stretching the resource further. Yeah, absolutely. And do you have some examples for that, that you're aware of in your business or in a business that you, you, know, you can contemplate? Where, I suppose, where this would happen? Yeah, I mean, even in my business, I suppose, um, there's a, there's, a, there's a stretch between theatre making and filmmaking that's happening right now. So as theatre makers, we're being asked to diversify our resourcing and, and capabilities to do more digital content. But the further we stretch that, the more we're struggling to, to, to yeah. create a return on investment. Yeah. And, and that's a great example, right? You go, I know how to do this. Although to an outsider, film sounds like exactly the same thing, it's not quite. And, yeah. and to create that value is actually a fairly unique skill set. And this is the fundamental part of, 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 the, uh, of RBB. So that's a, that's a good example. So somebody else have an example? But is, is it diversi uh, diversification? Can means other, other kind of diversification as well? Like the case study, the beer cases, the AB in Beth, like the leaders in their company, they are doing a lot of diversification, right? Yeah. So that's a good example. I mean, let's talk about if you know how to produce and sell beer, um, you know, you can non-diversify, you can sell more beer. So you've got a choice. You can either sell beer into more countries 
or you can sell different drinks into your home country. So they're both types of diversification and, and the, the, the same sort of logic applies. The more distinct the market, the more it's gonna stretch you, you know, to, to do it. Um, but a lot of these drinks companies, Coca-Cola will have, you know, bottled water and you know, health drinks and all sorts of things. So, okay, so in, sorry. So in that case, what, uh, what is the inevitable like a factor or like a moment to go for diverse, uh, diversification in the business? Why is it inevitable? Inevitable. Uh, what I'm saying is that, uh, you said that the more, uh, I mean, uh, product is diversified, the less profitable uh, the organization will get, right? But yeah. sometimes um, the business go for, uh, go after like a diversification. Yep. Right? So what is the uh, driver or like triggers to make the business to be diversified. Okay, so the trigger is that diversification occurs, and that's the sentence, when there's the management considers they have excess capacity. So that's the fundamental underlying driver is, hey, wait a second, we have excess capacity in something. So there's some good excess capacity and there's some bad. Some management says, hey, we've got a lot of cash, let's buy something. This is not a good idea for diversification. It always leads to problems. But you know, to use this in the most general sense, uh, you, could, you could say that that is a reason for the diversification. So firms, you know, by and large, want to expand. And you know, if you are uh, you know, Coca-Cola, you say, hold on, how do we get bigger? My shareholders want me to be bigger. Part of my strategy is that I need to grow my profitability. And I've now got Coca-Cola, let's say, in the United States. But I think that another country will want to drink Coca-Cola. So international diversification is a form of diversification. Uh, alternatively, as you're pointing out, you can have product diversification. So you can either have territory diversification or product or both. Um, but it, it's not you know, diversification. This logic applies to both forms. Um, you know, so if you stay in a market, and I think one of the cases, or certainly one of the cases we're going to be discussing, is about um, the distinction when we, as we get more into diversification, should a company or, or the cases about a company which makes some interesting decisions relating to diversifying into different industries. Um, so does does that mean like being less profitable doesn't mean that you are not earning more money, right? Like being more diversified, you are you are able to become the market leader, or you are able to expand your your profiles, so you can earn bigger revenue, but just less profitable. Does it make sense? Yeah. So okay. So um, I don't think so. If you, it depends how much resource you use. So obviously, if somebody gives you lots and lots of capital and you diversify further and further, your returns on the new capital will be smaller and smaller uh, until some stage that even if I give you more um, stuff, you actually make no more profit at all. Uh, so, so you could increase your dollar amount slightly, uh, but really this curve is talking about the challenge that if you step outside of what you do primarily, um, it becomes more and more difficult to deliver. So I'm gonna take um, Sanjay just because you're at the top of my screen. Uh, I go, so this is a fundamental thing that happens to any organization. When you deliver on something that's not your core, it's difficult to get it right. So if we look at armed services and we say, should um, you know, militaries be involved in policing, you know, frankly, around the world, this is, a, this is difficult for them. It's not easy. I mean, they can do it sometimes, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's necessary. You know, I don't want to get into the debate about the, the whys. It is a debate about, is it easy for them to deliver? And they don't have a rent concept, but the point that you go is, it actually requires a lot of differences. And the more dissimilar it becomes, the more, the, the more that an organization struggles to deliver. So you see the separation uh, and specialization in that. So in any country, you'll see that there's something called an army and there's something called a police force because you actually need quite a lot of differences. 
And you can always ask, you know, so, so that's just a, a, an example. Um, and, you know, but we can, we can look through almost any, any business. We've got that example from, um, you know, arts. I don't know if somebody else wants to give us another example. Uh, otherwise, I, I, you know, we can give an example like, <clears throat> why do you see so few car manufacturers making trucks? Right? I mean, you'd argue they've got wheels, they've got an engine. How hard can it be? I go, it's extremely different. And so you see that uh, this gets disposed of. So Volvo used to have Volvo trucks through to Volvo cars, and clearly that's gone. Uh, so, so even things that can appear quite similar, the point is, it is easier for Geely to buy Volvo than for Geely to decide that it's going to produce trucks because one is far along the diversification range. And this is an important point when you consider your business or any other business is how different is that core um, is this, where, where we're going versus where we are. Is it mainly incrementally done, Nicholas? Like I'm just trying to think of... Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, this, so that, that's this a really someone. good yeah, that's a good point. So there's actually a great paper, um, you know, which talks about this idea of incremental diversification. So it's almost always done incrementally because okay. it's, and the point is every time you take that step, you build a competence. And so it is possible for you to diversify quite far and not have a collapse in profits. Uh, there are still limits to that and we can talk about why, but the point is that as you diversify, you actually develop new skills anyway. And so that pushes out that frontier a little bit further. So, you know, if you started to produce films, you'd get better and better and better and better at it. And then somebody could say, well, why don't you produce animated stuff? And, you know, the point is from where you are today, that's an enormous leap. You say, with no way, we can't touch that. But if you fully develop the intermediate skill, then, then you have other real options. And so this is the same sort of idea you've got. If it's a very specific factor, your returns are really good. Right, so if you're doing something very, very specific, your returns are very good. Um, but the drop off is much faster, um, you know, in your diversification distance. So an interesting example of this is actually the history of Intel. Intel um, used to be a semiconductor wafer company about the 70s. And, um, you know, there's a great book about how they ended up producing microprocessors. But the point is that you know, now that they're quite specific in that, it, it's quite difficult for them to actually do much else. And a good example is that they are not considered the, the or they're definitely not the premier chip in tablets and in, in phones. And so if you get extremely good at something, you're in great returns, but your limit is closer than if you have something that's quite generic. And this is sort of a trade-off, right? It's, uh, every, everybody would love the, this to not be a trade-off, but the more generic things are things like I have a massive balance sheet. You go, well, you can do anything then, but you're probably never going to earn these super returns. And on the other hand, you say, well, I produce semiconductor, you know, chips for laptops and I'm unbelievably good at it. Nobody can compete. And you sit over here, you know, none of this is to say that Intel will be around in a hundred years. It's just to point out that when you become very, very, very good at something, you tend to top out early or at, an, at a shorter distance. And the evidence is that Intel is uh, nowhere in, in mobile phone uh, chips because they are extremely specialized in what they do. And that's not a bad thing, it's just a trade-off. Okay, so here we've got a, a two by two and I'm pushing on uh, just because I wanna get to the case study. And so here you've got this idea that um, if I have low factor specificity, so remember those low, low they're, they're kind of um, more imitable, so cash or something like that, and I, and I am nearby, then what I end up is with medium diversification and average rents. If my factor is low and I go far, um, then I tend to have low rents. So this is something that is, tends to be not, you know, you know kind of um, not done very much this bottom section, in particularly in developed markets. Highly specific factors, um, you know, I, I tend to have narrow diversification and great rents. Um, and what I can also do is go and say, um, uh, no diversification and very high rents. So, so 
what the difference is here is that where is the closest opportunity? If the closest opportunity is quite far, this guy does not differentiate. Diversifies her. So let me repeat that. If the best opportunity is very far, a very specific factor, you just don't diversify. It's not gonna work. So, so what, they end, what you end up with is you go, I'm just good at this little uh, vertical, I make great profits in it, but I'm not making the leap because they will top out uh, and they will be not profitable um, well before they're in the, the next niche. All right, so that's just about resources, tangible assets. So I, I would like to have a question. Absolutely, yeah, no worries. Yeah, so, so for example, uh, let's say Dyson, uh, I'm just uh, like uh, just a pick yep. up the uh, just an example. It may not be a uh, factual, okay? So Dyson, uh, Dyson is very good at um, uh, uh, manufacturing the fan and then um, yep. uh, vacuum cleaner and hair dryer and etc. They let's say they are very um, cash rich, yep. but they. Um, they they want to invest the uh, uh, I mean uh, those like a uh, uh, cash in somewhere, but uh, they do not know about like for example how to manufacture like uh, uh, electronic uh, 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 appliance uh, appliance and etc. So in that case, uh, the Dyson case is falling into category D. Am I correct? Okay, so <clears throat> okay, so if they do invest. And the only thing they can bring to the party is cash. Cash is a low factor specificity, right? You've seen it. It's, oh, yes. it's nice to have. If that's all they can bring to the party, then that's low. And, and then you're going to sit here. So, I mean, it's quite possible for them to, to buy another company. I mean, I'd suggest long term it won't work out. Um, but you know, if, if the only thing you can do is bring cash, it's, you're going to be sitting in that, in that column there. Um, Dyson would have a very, I mean, I presume they have a very strong techno technological. Yeah. In terms of their, in a, so I know, don't think Jim was talking about Dyson, you know, too much, but yeah. yeah. So Dyson itself may have a reasonably wide range, but of course everybody's got limits, right? Um, yeah. So this very broad diversification fell out of favor because it's very difficult to actually make any money out of it. A long time ago. So, if we take um, perhaps um, some other examples, like uh, and, and Paul, to take on your point, uh, what happened with Porsche in the in the in the early two thousands? Porsche motor vehicles is you started out with um, the nine uh, the nine eleven right the nine one one, and so that you know that is narrow diversification. You earn great money. That's what you produce. And what did they do? They said, okay, cool. We will produce things that are nearby. So the next thing was, I think the Boxster was next in their range. And so they stayed quite close and they built out their capabilities. And then what was then nearby was the SUV, the Cayenne. And, and your factor specificity starts to become less and less specific, right? Because you've gone from we produce um, 911 type sports cars to we produce SUVs. And is that really the same core as what we were? And as you can see, the rents are going to start reducing a little bit. And that's exactly what happened to Porsche. So on a percentage profitability basis, uh, you know, they reduced a bit, but their volume, Vicky, their volume made up for it in their life. So they were quite happy to make a lot more money today than they did. And they stretch their brand slowly from this. And, and you, you'll probably see the same thing, you know, Lamborghini is trying to produce an SUV. So this is the same kind of, uh, kind of journey. Uh, when, when you talk about um, uh, an example where, you know, no money is being made, even though the marketing is amazing, it's this idea of Tesla and and the Elon Musk brand, you've got kind of very low factor specificity, not sure what it is really, except capital. And, and you've gone into these distant things, and you tend to have low rents. And another thing is SoftBank. SoftBank is the Japanese, uh, you know, investment firm, 
What have they got? They've got capital. And so you end up with low returns because you just shower the world. You're not re you don't have this complicated set of very interrelated processes. Remember the things you got, you were talking about, skills, people, supplier networks, that makes you a lot of money. Uh, just capital is, is not particularly in of itself the thing that produces returns because there's a lot of it out there. Sorry, the uh, why SoftBank is uh, uh, related to distant in terms of uh, closes the entry opportunity? Um, so SoftBank has got capital, which is not a very specific factor, right? Right. And SoftBank is in technology, but just about everything from Uber to Greensill's capital. Okay. Right? That is as distant as you're ever going to get. You go... In the practical sense, you go, what their contribution to Greensill's capital is, apart from just the checkbook, is little. And so you end oh, up with low returns, which is exactly where they are. And that's not because it's a particularly bad guy. It's because what do they offer that is unique and difficult to imitate to, to customers? And the answer is, well, nothing. They, they have a lot of capital, um, staggering amounts, and that is that is where it is. So... Um, you know, that doesn't particularly work. On the other hand, Apple buys a company about once, uh, I think they said something like they buy one company a week, Apple, um, you know, but, but they, they kind of stick to areas where the factor specificity is much, much better. So something in the middle here. And so their rents remain pretty high. I have another question, right? So let's say, um, uh, the case of the company is uh, falling into a sea. Yeah. So falling into sea, uh, which is uh, like uh, um, bottom uh, bottom left hand side. All right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so in that uh, in this case, even though the profit is low, but a company can generate a lot of revenue because of the diversification, yeah. sure. right? But sure. however. The tax, uh, tax is very high. So in that case, would it be a good idea to, uh, I mean, to go for diversification? So in C, I would say that the bulk of evidence suggests that C is not sustainable, that eventually you reach limits and you're really better off investing your money in the stock market. So mm. outside of emerging economies, C tends to have a big discount in your stock valuation, like 20%. If you break those companies up, they're worth 20% more. Uh, and that reflects a real dislike from investors of this idea that one person's trying to run such a diverse portfolio. So I, I, whilst it's possible, and, and you see this kind of like Toyota 2 show, very diverse stuff. Um, you know, so you really got to think about what it is that they're good at, um, because their returns are poor, and their returns are poor. You can see, you go have a look. I'm not bashing Susha, you know, it's a huge company, but but the, the thing we're talking about here is strategy, and you know, and it's about going, okay, where do you earn good returns, and where do you earn low returns? And this is really the principle that the more similar the business is to your core business, the better your returns are going to be. And the more you have to stretch your competence and your capability, the more difficult it's going to be. And that's a universal kind of saying. You can, if you're exceptional at making, um, you know, semiconductors, uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that the next thing on the on that is easy to make, or you won't make the same returns. If you say, well, semiconductors is one thing, I can make motherboards. You go, you probably could, but uh, your returns are going to be lower. Now, that's not saying you shouldn't do it or can't do it. It's saying that, remember, a firm is a resource-based view. We put together skills and abilities and it makes us produce good outcomes. Uh, and that's not the same for other products. And therefore we are heterogeneous. And that is what is the basis of us earning different returns. Otherwise, we'd simply compete. Uh, firms would compete to whoever had the best capital would instantly replicate the best firm and it would be, be done. So that there's no risk of that. So okay, thank you. Outcomes. All right, I'm just going to move on now. So, um, as I said, we only have one or two, and then we're going to get to, uh, and I'd like to have some time for discussion as well. 
So product diversification leads to the following challenges. And, and I think you all sort of appreciate that. Manufacturing becomes difficult. So uh, when, when we think about, um, you know, so Cindy in, in, um, in semiconductors going, if you decided to do motherboards, it's going to be difficult. It's a, it's a whole new world. How, you know, how does this work? Uh, R&D becomes difficult if you jump out. Uh, marketing becomes difficult. Let's say you decide you're a product and you go from, uh, you know, you, you, you go from beer to running hotels. You go, okay, but it's a completely different skill set. Your returns are not going to look the same. Uh, and then location diversification. If you're a producer, you have supplier challenges, as we've discussed. You could have logistics challenges, HR, organizational challenges. And if you simply sell, it's going to be marketing, product, channel, and regulations uh, differences. These are real things, and you shouldn't ignore them. And the more different what you're trying to do is from what you currently do, the lower the return is going to be. So it's very important, all the case studies you go to, this is a fundamental concept. The more different the thing you do is, the more difficult it's going to be. Uh, we're going to see that come up in Gemawatt's uh, cage analysis, um, and we're going to see that uh, in, in your assignments. So it's more just keeping the concept in mind. Um, okay, and, then, and, and this is kind of an outflow of that. So this is a, a university in the Scandinavian countries called Uppsala, it's the Uppsala model. And they talk about entry into foreign markets being about learning. So first you do foreign sales at the bottom here because it's the easiest, right? So all you do is you, you ship product. So um, if, if you were dealing with a Chinese auto industry in the early 2000s, they said, here's a car, you take it. There's no warranty, there's nothing. You just take the car and, and uh, we don't, don't call us. And, and, and that was a model. But then as you become a little more sophisticated, you set up a sales agent, you are my authorized dealer and I'm gonna provide you with warranties and, and you know, various sort of standard protocols. And then you get better at it and you say, well, actually I could do this myself in a foreign country. And then finally you say, well, what, hold on, I can do a fully integrated operation. And so the point here is that the complexity, you walk it up to Paul's questions, not just product, but internationalization is a learning experience for companies walk each step. Um, so if, if you get asked the question, hold on, what should we do? We're, we're gonna internationalize. We've never internationalized before. The only really incorrect answer that I'm gonna be upset about is if you say, well, we should jump in boots and all and just do a fully integrated foreign subsidiary because it might work. I go, yeah, but wow. If that's not something you know how to do, start small. And when you go back to your boards, uh, the same, they're going to have the same comments as me. They're going to say, well, you know, what is our baby steps that we can take? Um, so setting up a full greenfield site with no international experience, which was something very unusual in the Fahey milk case. Uh, it's, it's unusual. Yeah. Okay. Um, a simple extension of this is obviously you start with markets that are very similar to your home market. So... Um, it's easier if you have your home market or a very similar market, and then you go to markets that are not like us. So you start with like us and then not like us. So this is easy. Blue is less easy, but you can see that it's probably easier to have a foreign subsidiary in a market that's very similar to your home market. Um, then, uh, you know, you could take a not like us market and have a foreign sales agent. So that's kind of uh, equal easiness. And then a foreign integrated subsidiary is probably as difficult as a foreign subsidiary if the market is dissimilar. And then finally, you've got strange people. And I use that just casually saying, so a very different market. You're then gonna say, well, it's probably somewhat similar difficulty rating for me to have a sales agent in a very different market as it is to have a fully integrated subsidiary in a market that's exactly the same because I have to learn this. There's a few cultural problems, there's less marketing problems, the supply chains are less different. The point is that this, is, this dimension uh, works when you talk about internationalization as well. Okay, the more diverse you are, the more information must flow. There are limits to managerial capacity. Uh, there are also limits from the bureaucracy. There are social limits. Uh, and so, um, 
you know, really expanding further and further away from, uh, from your core is quite difficult. Um, I'm going to stop here because I'd like to just touch on the case study. Uh, so we, we can ask some questions there. And I'm going to therefore get that out of the slideshow. Let me put this one up. And are you seeing Safal now? Yeah. Great. Let's see the last screen as well. All right. So I'm going to, just to keep this quick, what we're going to do is take all of these questions. I'm going to break you into groups. We're going to give you sort of 10 minutes. So that's the best we can do because uh, I know, for example, Sanjay, that it's uh, super late there now. Um, and we're then going to come back and we're going to go through these answers at uh, reasonable speed and see if we can uh, do the sum justice, interesting case study, interesting market. Um, and so, yeah, these are the things that I'd like you to touch on, please. So um, perhaps following uh, Jenny's idea, we can say that how many questions do we have here? We've got six questions. So maybe each group just does two of them, right? Do you, when you break into your groups, do you have a group number? Does the number stay constant or not? I mean, I, I can see a group number. Okay, so your participants are there and May is nodding, you also have a number. So I can just put one, two, and three and we can figure it out like that. Okay, so maybe we make this one, uh, two, three, uh, and then we can do, uh, well, we could do it like this, right? Just, there's just three groups, right? Cool. All right. Um, is that reasonable or does group three get sort of the less uh, interesting stuff? I think we, we may need to manage with this. All right, so I'm gonna break everyone into a group and I'll put this back up. And if we could tackle it that way, we should be able to get traction with this. Got it. There we are. <clears throat> right, group one. Let's let's hear it. Yeah. Uh, so we looked at TC, uh, TTC. So we said its core uh, capability was an uh, automotive car maker uh, manufacturer. Okay. Um, the we looked quickly at the SWAT. So we were looking at them as a strength, as a proven brand and reputation in the global market. Right. Um, we looked at their weakness being around the lack of uh, knowledge of culture, um, particularly when moving into a new market like Africa. Yep. Um, we looked at the opportunities, new market and expansion, um, joint ventures and learning through M&As. &A, &A um, and we looked at the um, threat was just around quality control of, of kind of expanding into that new market and, and, and being able to follow that and lead, lead in that area. Um, we noticed that in terms of some of their value chain, like what was their strength, they, 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 I think they were known for letting, so I think like uh, CFAO was given a chance to continue running its operations. So uh -huh. we were talking about it, its uh, strategic position of allowing the operations to run within the, the location geographically um, and not to interfere. But then we know eventually they did buy them out more and, and it maybe got a little bit more complex further down the line. Um, because their intent was about, uh, I think the article says about the, creating this uh, 
a gateway to enter the uh, African French speaking countries. So we knew that they had a very clear intent to move into that market. Um, why to invest? Um, again, it was about market expansion in across Africa, about learning and knowledge transfer. They had a they had a aim, a strategic aim to develop their 50-50% of between being non-automotive and, and automotive. And so we know that they were after a certain amount of um, learning and, and market around general consumer goods. All right, perfect. Okay, so one of, one of the challenges uh, I think um, here with, with, your, with your group's answer is uh, really around this idea that TDC is a general trading company. So a Toyota Tsusho uh, isn't, uh, isn't really a car. They don't, they don't manufacture cars at all. They're part of the Toyota group, but, but they're a trading company actually. So, so I think uh, maybe the SWAT was led a bit of astray by, by this overlap of Toyota. The car business, which, which uh, Tsusho isn't Tsusho, is uh, what's a, it's a, as a trading house, what they do is intermediate between the car factory, which is one set of skills and cannot diversify into running uh, hundreds of different countries. And this is a good example of, so I just wanna I'll just spend two seconds on this point. So the Toyota plant builds cars and, and what they don't want to do is they don't wanna run uh, importation, distribution, brand management, all the things that, that what we see of uh, as a car brand in small markets, in uh, diverse markets and in unstable markets. So this is Africa, this is parts of Latin America. So let's just talk a little bit. One slide ago, uh, we spoke about um, diversification and, and the ability of firms to do it and the, the learning curve. So Toyota in its early days when they launched Toyota 1970 uh, was they actually um, distributed wow. even into, I mean, they sold as uh, third party sales, just like that upsell the model into countries, including Australia. Um, so actually uh, the families, there's, there's a couple of remaining distributors. So in Florida, there's one and in Western Australia, the, the kind of, patron of it, um, he just, just passed away. And so they actually would say, okay, cool, you take Toyotas and you sell them, you set up brands, you control the dealerships, you do all of those intermediary functions and the customer gets the car. And the reason you do that is because you simply cannot learn enough. And so you're either gonna be very bad at building cars or you're gonna be very bad at distributing. And so you, you simply sell. And then they learned more and more and more and so in Australia now, majority except for this, um, this WA is done by Toyota head office controlled business because they've learned. Uh, Tsusho exists in order to fill that gap. So Tsusho specialized in distributing into difficult markets and, and maybe cynically, they also provide a, a firewall between the guys who fit guns onto the back of these things and fight civil wars and the factory, which doesn't want to have anything to do with that. Um, so Tsusho is actually a trading company. Um, and so let me just click across to that first question. Um, um, so, so their intent was um, listed, uh, you know, in, in the cases uh, kind of, uh, so a couple of things, you're right. They want it to be in Africa. They want to be the right one they mentioned, which is you know, some sort of unusual statement. Uh, but the strength of a trading house is that they have a global, uh, global strength, their relationship clearly with Toyota is unchallengeable. You'll never beat that and you'll never, you never break them apart. Uh, you know, so that's, uh, the weakness is that they tend to be very diversified firms. Uh, so to show, uh, and it notes here that um, they do everything from chemicals to foods, to infrastructure, automotive sector, pretty much they're massive and they usually have massive balance sheets in, in the region of a hundred billion US dollars. Um, but the, the profitability tends to be quite average, uh, as we've just discussed. The reason for that, not because they're bad guys. Uh, so they have a very substantial acquisition ability. Uh, and obviously the threat is kind of moderate. It's just geopolitical getting into Africa. Now the competitive advantage is absolutely massive balance sheet and unique supply relationships. And when I say unique, I mean, this is kind of the deal. You're not gonna get Toyota franchise away from Toyota Tsusho. 
independent, irrespective of the performance. Um, and so the, the value chain is complex, and, and I'd suggest that their support activities are, are big, but in, in, in relation to Africa, the inbound logistics is particularly good. Um, so they're probably inbound logistics, marketing and sales organizations. So this is, this is what uh, a trading house does. Um, and uh, so group number two, do you want to take us through uh, CFAO? Maybe. Unless there's any questions about TTC. Okay. Uh, let me introduce uh, slightly about this uh, CIFO. CIFO basically was a uh, parent company organization. It's actually Toyota Tiso. Okay, just now I think uh, we have mentioned that uh, from uh, Paul. So uh, it is a 170 years old uh, company in Africa. So presently there are actually 38 African countries uh, within. They have uh, actually seven French overseas departments, uh, including Myanmar and Vietnam. So uh, what do actually, there are the three main business sectors. Uh, they are doing the uh, equipment and services, 54% uh, revenue from that. Healthcare, which is 36% of revenue, and also consumer goods, which is 10% uh, of revenue. So uh, to them, they have actually seven different business unit. Uh, They're doing equipment and service, seafood technologies, healthcare, uh, consumer goods, uh, and also seafood retails and African shops. So we look at it, they are like, uh, uh, they also do a seafood motors. They also do a retail service. They also supply uh, seafood equipments like those are construction uh, uh, lorries and uh, a crane and things like that. And uh, they, are, uh, they are actually, in, they are one of the dominant uh, companies supplying equipments uh, in Africa. They are, they are strength basically, and they're very familiar with uh, Africa since they are, uh, they have been there for so many years, uh, mm -hmm. 170 years, and they are, have a very rich uh, connection and database with the local governments. Right. And so, yep. And uh, they're also in the uh, FMB recently, which is, uh, they are also providing uh, Heineken beer. They are one of the importer and also some uh, retail products uh, like uh, shampoos and they also align with uh, L'Oreal, okay? And they yep. also were doing retail food. Uh, so they're actually very diversified on, the, on their businesses in Africa. Right. Yep. So uh, let me see anything else you can share. Uh, when talk about revenue, uh, they are very strong right now. Uh, 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 revenue in uh, recorded in two zero one nine. Okay, I think uh, yeah. So uh, maybe we should move just a little to the question, just given the time. Um, so are we are we talking about Safal and their um, you know their sort of uh, SWATs and so on. Uh, Leon, you're on mute, and we can't hear. Sorry, we have not really touched on the swap, but uh, only very, uh, very. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So I think that, um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, thank you for some of the, the the more detailed analysis. I think what we're trying to understand is just the, the core, some of the core strengths and weaknesses of them. Uh, I think you mentioned the the absolute biggest strength or competitive advantage, which is this very long, very strong history in, in Africa. Yes. Um, and that comes with a very integrated supply chain and extensive geographic reach, which means 38 countries. Um, so they're the number one, I'll just put the N one, number one trading company with great institutional knowledge. 107 years means you've learned and learned and learned and your structures reflect your market. Uh, mm -hmm. The big weakness is that, as you pointed out, but I, I think it's quite important that you actually highlight it or say it, is they're quite unrelated. I mean, they sell shampoo. This is PPR, uh, their, their parent company. And then Safar sells cars. And you go, okay, well, what's that got to do with itself? And, and the answer is, well, nothing really. Um, obviously, the opportunity in this business is a good middle class, and the, the threats are just the same as TTC. Uh, and their intent is to be uh, in a leading position in, in each industry. So again, their, their value chain uh, rests on uh, the very good executive management uh, and, and superb sort of inbound logistics. They're actually good operators. 
um, you know, because they run really motor dealerships throughout Africa. So, you know, I think this is how I probably would have approached um, the Safal question, you know, just uh, quickly. You're touching on the points, but you've got to conclude with them. So I agree with your analysis of the financial statements, but the point that it raises is inside this big PPR company, you've got all sorts of things, and, and that's maybe, uh, maybe a bit of a weakness uh, for why they're related. So group three, can we talk about why did Safar, why did PPR exit um, the CFAO or Safal um, investment? So I I guess um, like what just what the previous group just mentioned, it is unrelated to whatever that PPR would like to do. Uh, because of the PPR founder's son took over as the leaders and they would like to refocusing on the luxury fashion industry, that is good mm -hmm. and so based on that uh, C CFAO's business model or business uh, areas or division is no longer relevant and they would like to use and they would like to sell, uh, sell the share to TTC to get the money for for the, the new business that they would like to be focusing on. Yeah, absolutely. So in the more general sense, um, uh, kind of there's three reasons you get rid of something. Um, you know, one is your head office needs the money. Two is that the unit is poorly performing and you want to get rid of it, it's like an anchor. And three is lack of interrelationship. Uh, and so clearly this is, this is well, this fits neatly there. So far so there's no evidence that their performance was bad. And there's no evidence that PPR needed the money urgently. So, uh, you know, and I, I, I tend to agree with you. I go, this is unrelated. And for whatever reason, now PPR has decided to be more related. No problem. You know, that seems fair, but there was nothing else there. Uh, and it also talks to, as Leon mentioned, the limits of diversification. You know, so far as now, you know, they're doing everything, these guys. And so you go, well, if you're going to reduce your diversification, there's a balance. If you get rid of something which is not very good, you won't get any money for it. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want to get rid of your absolute best asset. And so you know, there's a, a discussion and, and they chose to sell CFO. And um, the other kind of unique thing, it's not really covered in the case, but in general is um, these are durable goods. And so your volatility of makeup and shampoo is much, much lower than your volatility on, on motor vehicle sales. So, you know, um, in, in, in line with that strategy of tidying up their balance sheet and moving to less volatile outcomes, you would do this. And, and, and this sort of makes sense if you, just as an aside, like if you look at vehicle sales in Mozambique, they will wildly range when, when oil prices are high to when they're not, you know, so you, you'll move by a factor of five, whereas shampoo and FMCG is maybe 20% up with that. Okay, and then obviously this allows them to reallocate capital to areas of higher. So um, Paul spoke about why um, TTC invested. Um, Paul, did you want to expand on that, or is that we were? Yeah, we we're looking at the 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 the, the, the expansion into the consumer goods. So they was drive they, and they also knew that. And uh, why TTC bought Safal? Um, in terms of their expansion into the um, African market, that was what we. Yep, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So I mean, fundamentally, the the big thing was uh, their strategic intent, right? TTC has made it clear that they're going to be in every African country. Yeah. And that's why the second question I think is quite important, very important for this course, is why why didn't they go and set up a dealership. I mean, certainly they could get Toyota to give them all the dealerships. That wouldn't have been a problem. But you can imagine the amount of learning they would have had to go through. So you've got geographical diversity, uh, trading knowledge, diverse environments. And so here I would suggest a good example of acquisition being a much less painful uh, route. And in fact, they almost did a JV style acquisition. As you see, they bought shares over four years. And this was about them slowly learning and it fits very neatly um, with this uh, idea of what resource or what fundamental knowledge do you have and what do you need it to be and so what they've done here is they've bought somebody who's already an expert kind of bought a block stock and barrel 
they haven't, as you pointed out, they didn't really mess with it. And they said, okay, cool, let's just see um, if we can uh, generate the returns that we bought here. So, so remember, what are the other options they had? They could have done a Greenfields. We discussed this with Faye Milk. They could have done JV. They could have done an acquisition. And we explained the, the, the choice here is really about, well, how much do you know? How much do you need to know? And what's the environment like? So here you have a very unstable environment and uh, you know, they don't know how to do it. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a, a reasonable decision. Uh, and, and they were really following their intent to represent Toyota everywhere. And, and so that's what they did. All right, the next question for group two was about uh, CFAO's performance. And what did we expect to be like post acquisition? Do you think this worked well or worked out badly? How? I think uh, not so well. Look at the numbers that they have actually for last year. They uh, have a uh, 5.5 billion. But the thing is, uh, the internal, they have a lot of uh, staff. So, so which, which, which exhibits are you talking, referring to? Sorry? Which, which exhibit, just so everyone can follow? Where do you say 5.5? The 5.5 billion is on their uh, revenue. Uh, no, I understand. Which, which exhibit are you referring to, Leon, so everyone can follow? What do you mean? Which um, in the pack? Which where did you get the five point five figure from? Oh, it's actually from total revenue on the four four main businesses: uh, mobility, healthcare, consumer goods, and infrastructure, and energy. And which which exhibit is that? It's actually uh, in, on their on their website. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah. So, but uh, on the other hand, they actually also shares about. Uh, uh, their expenditures on uh, training on their staff because they have uh, a lot of staff. They spend about 4.4 uh, million pounds on it. Okay. So uh, they, is, is, although they are a very big uh, organization and seems like uh, they are being stapled in Africa for so many years, but the growth of their staff, their operation costs, and also uh, 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 this, uh, uh, the new tech coming in which they still need to continue to invest uh, money on uh, training their, their existing staff and also uh, sub, uh, setting up new infrastructures for the, to actually- Okay, so uh, let me just, let's pause and say, okay, so imagine you've got um, TTC wanting to do this business in Africa. Hmm. And so we're talking about uh, how could they have done it more efficiently, right? So we've decided that's their intent. And Leon, the board has said to you, Leon, congrats, you know, we are TTC and you are our executive head of, of Africa. That's what we've decided. We're going in. Do you believe that the purchase of CFAO would lead to higher training costs or lower training costs, all else being equal? I mean, I, I appreciate that CFAO is training a lot, but my question is, do you believe that TT is, are you proposing that TTC should have or could have done this uh, with less training than CFAO? Because I, th I think that that's kind of maybe the, the core of the question. If if you if you go down the, the path of training, I think uh, they should actually uh, need to train. But the thing is, uh, uh, they they since they are uh, they they actually saturated into so many different uh, locations in Africa, mm -hmm. and they got so many staff uh, to to have this training uh, so called multiplied to all these areas. It's actually uh, it's very challenging for TTC as well. I, I, it undoubtedly is. Uh, it's it's a it's a torturous market to operate in. Um, you know, it's very tough. But I, I suppose maybe the question here is: Okay, would do you think that CFAO has performed better than they would have alone, the same or worse than they would have alone, mm. since they were bought by TTC? Mm. And the acquisition contributes to that. And Leon, you're not alone. Anybody else can talk, just you're the only one brave enough to go for the question. So, you know, what, no, so I go, it, it's fire away. Girls, fire away. <laughs> so, I mean, my, some perspectives on, on, on the performance of it, um, you know, and this is some, some real info. 
So firstly, there were some problems like Nissan, uh, you know, Nissan canceled them. Uh, and this wouldn't have happened if TTC hadn't bought them. And this one was about 10% of their sales. I don't think it was in the notes, but uh, so clearly that was a huge issue. Um, but because we've noted that their interrelationship was quite small, their performance was actually fairly reasonable. Um, now, I'm not saying that, that their, their accounts are very good or very bad. What I'm saying is, that this acquisition in of itself didn't materially change much about CFAO, certainly around the acquisition time. Uh, and I think that talks to how it was done, but also the fact that it wasn't that they had to disentangle CFAO very much from PPR. Uh, so, so whilst I appreciate that the training bill is very high, you know, I'm not sure that TTC has made it worse or better. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think it's been very limited impact probably from TTC. One of the big things that happened, as I said, was Nissan, but maybe that's unimportant to to either to show, uh, you know, certainly drop their returns. Um, but I'm not sure that they could have really, if their goal was to get into Africa, I'm not sure many other plans. Uh, there was an interesting thing, and this is a bit of a, a you know, a, a sophisticated point about bargaining. So if you're TTC, when you buy a delisted or a, or a um, uh, divested subsidiary of a listed company. Typically, and you're not expected to know this for any reason, but the, the evidence shows that typically they're actually reasonably priced for buyers. Um, and buyers, that's um, true show, usually get rewarded by their shareholders because they get to buy things at quite a good multiple. And it's actually a win-win because sellers are rewarded because people say, good, you're focusing more. So, so just to let's wrap up this section of the question. The question was really, did this entity perform better or worse because of this transaction? Um, you know, was it disappointing or not? So, uh, I mean, I understand it may not be a good business in some people's eyes, but I go, its performance was actually fairly, was fairly reasonable, except for the fact that they lost Nissan, which was probably a fairly big blunder. Uh, they lost a lot of money over that issue. Now, it doesn't make a difference in two shows balance sheet, but uh, I mean, we could still argue that that was, that was kind of avoidable mistake, um, you know, that they blundered into. Uh, but in general, I would suggest this probably delivered the returns it was going to expect it to deliver. Nothing good, nothing bad. Um, and so I think we're on to, is this the last one? Is it now two or three integrate or partnership? Let me next? Try. Okay. I think I think originally uh, when uh, TTC acquired CA, uh, CFAO, they are in a partnership uh, relationship because uh, TTC only acquired like ninety seven point eight percent of the uh, CFAO share, and TTC is always in a supporting role, like helping CFAO in terms of the uh, uh, management and the logistic. But uh, TTC also allows CFAO to maintain the autonomy and the entrepreneur uh, spirits. But at the same time, CFAO, after the acquisition, uh, helped TTC to gain the presence in uh, 53 or 54 Africa uh, country. So they are, they are kind of like complementary to each other. So at the beginning, I, I think they are they are in the uh, partnership relationship, but after all, four years later of the acquisition, uh, TTC decided to uh, acquire like 100% share of CFAO, so to wholly own uh, T uh, CFAO because uh, TTC saw that the CFAO's shareholders, it's only like purely interested in the, in the money, but not in the strategy or the, maybe the development of the company. So, so after four years later, I guess at the moment they are integrated instead of partnership. That's my understanding from the mm. case. Yeah, so I think that that's, that's a fair way of seeing it. Um, here's kind of a table of, uh, you know, maybe a simple table of what, what would make us tell the difference. So, um, you know, they, they left them with separate structure, as you mentioned. Operationally, they really said, well, let's try get some efficiency, but they didn't try and extensively integrate it. 
the management team was largely distinct, although they, they sent an expat uh, to be co-CEO, which is sort of quite standard for Japanese trading firms. High levels of autonomy and slow integration. So I would agree, I think broadly speaking, they approached this this way. But of course, once you own 100%, you're slowly going to drift this way. Uh, and perhaps in, in time, it won't be distinguishable. Um, so, I, and I think that this feeds into the prior question, which is, well, uh, you know, you, it, was there a big reason we'd expect CFAO's performance to change suddenly? And you said, no, they kind of were left to run the way they were going to run anyway. And that's what they did. Uh, and so you'd imagine pretty similar returns uh, to come out of it. So, um, yeah, so this is, um, you know, fairly, you know, complex sort of case, uh, you know, and we're, we're done with it now. We, let's just recap a couple of things we've said, because I know we're a little over time. Um, so we, 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 we just had a look at TTC and, and we said that Toyota Susha is a trading business uh, and they have a strategic intent. Remember, we, we touched on intent. This is the big goal this is a decision every company needs to make about itself and it's not it's not implied by its markets or anything else it's just what the company wants to do um, uh, they have a massive relationship with toyota they're a huge company not particularly profitable because they're widely uh, everyone noted paul noted that they're into you know like everything uh, and so that you know there's soft profitability um, but they have this huge ability to acquire things and so and these unique relationships. And so what they go out and do is buy CFAO, who is a, a subsidiary of a very diverse company, but they largely do vehicles, vehicle servicing, that sort of thing, uh, with strong, you know, Leon mentioned 170 years, lots of institutional knowledge. They really know the space. TTC doesn't. TTC buys somebody who really knows the space and has deep and integrated supply chains, which are important in Africa, where you, you know, it's difficult to get things done. And then they largely leave them alone to carry on a CFAO. And because they do it like that, what they do is they buy the knowledge, the institutional expertise, and then they spend several years kind of getting normal returns out of it. The big blunder obviously being this and leaving. But otherwise, they did something that if TTC wanted to do it themselves, enter Africa themselves, would have been extraordinarily difficult. You would have 38 different businesses you need to start in different countries with different regulation, with different supplier networks. And you can imagine this just being an enormous problem. So, you know, the question here isn't, do we think, oh, you know, I suppose on one level, Leon, you're answering the question, do we think TTC should have done it? But on another level, if we say TTC is going to do this, uh, I would suggest that this supports that this is a probably as effective a way as they could do it and doing it by themselves is difficult. Uh, we, can, we can discuss at length if they should have done it, is it really a good business and can they really add much value? And I would suggest that being a trading house, they tend to add, uh, you know, with, with due respect, uh, probably on the moderate to low levels of value. Uh, they tend to be, you know, they're so big, so broadly spread that they, it's really about their massive, massive balance sheet, some good relationships and, and maybe some reasonable supply chain knowledge, um, you know, but otherwise they're, they're, it's just so broad. Why did CFA exit? We said, well, it's just that PPR decided that they were too unrelated and they were focusing and they were focusing, they thought they could get better returns with lower volatility and reallocate their capital. Um, and so, you know, this is how it worked out. Um, and they were left largely alone. So, yeah, um, uh, a very, you know, I mean, like it's a complex case. Uh, doing business in all these small African countries is very difficult. And so I think, Leon, if you watch them over, over years, you'll notice that it's a permanently difficult business. Um, and that's... Uh, just a feature of it. So to give you a real number, a vehicle that you sell, let's say in Kenya, you will sell for twice in US dollar terms, twice the price that you'll sell it in a country like South Africa. Now, South Africa is not Australia, but you'll charge double the price. And your returns as a dealership are actually, unfortunately, only around four or 5% of turnover. 
even though you're charging double to your end customer. Uh, the markets are extraordinarily difficult to operate in. You've got regulatory problems, you've got market problems, you've got staff problems, you've got supply chain problems. Um, so, I mean, yeah, we, we could debate for a long time, should they have done this? But given that they were going to do it, uh, the purchase of CFAO is probably not, not a terrible idea. And that is us. So, um, sorry to have to leave you guys, but uh, this is the end of the, the session. And we'll see you on Thursday, unless there's some questions now. Otherwise, of course, just email, no problem, and we can answer any other questions. So yeah, I'm quite happy, and I'll formalize that, put into email, quite happy that you don't need to submit anything on Wednesday. Um, but if we, you know, I mean, uh, no problems if you ask questions on Wednesday, but we only need the, your PowerPoint just before the Thursday actual session. Uh, can I have a question? For sure. assessment one, uh, the group presentation, yep. uh, we just go through the uh, background of the, the company the the company through this uh, framework like uh, RBV, PRIO analysis, uh, must we actually come up any suggestion or recommendation on it? Right. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I think that there are there are some questions in the case, and so when I ask you to recommend something, yes, uh, you'll need to recommend. Uh, so, it's not it's not required that you do extensive out of out of study. You know, uh, as you've done, Leon, that, that level of, of effort isn't shouldn't be required. Maybe just to clear up some understanding in somebody's mind. You know, you might you know, happy for you to obviously look at their websites. These are real companies that have done real things. Yeah. Uh, but but if you find yourself trawling for hours, uh, that's that's not really expected. Um, you know, just get through the thing. Just practice using the models. You'll notice we're going to practice these and then practice them again. And your final submission, you'll practice them again. So they should be pretty refined, um, you know, understanding of them. Okay, thank you, Nick. Nick, just to buy time, uh, if if the group is going to do the presentation, so could we share? Could we just use the share function of the Zoom to show the PowerPoint slide on first day? So after the presentation, we can upload right away to LMS. Uh, yeah, sure. Look, I, I mean, I don't want to create an incentive for for you to a avoid the lesson or b be um, be working on the PowerPoint during the lesson. But um, there'll be no advantage to doing it that way because there's going to be no sort of giveaway answers during the lecture. Um, so I, I go whilst I don't have a, a problem with that, I, I'm not sure it's going to incentivize the right sort of stuff. I, I don't mind if you want to share off your machine, that's no problem. But I think I'd prefer if you sort of sent in and finalized your presentation before okay. the lesson, otherwise it's going to be... Understood. I, mean, like I don't really know what you'll use the time for. Okay. Thank you, guys. It's been great. And um, I hope you have a great week and I'll see you Thursday. Yep. Thank you, Nicholas. Cool. Thanks, Cheers. Nicholas. Thank you, Nicholas. Bye. Thank you.